185milesouth.com. Smash that Patreon button. One hundred and eighty five miles south, a hardcore punk rock podcast. What's up, everyone? This week on the pod, we are jumping into the daunting task of talking about the best 100 punk and hardcore records of the 2000s. Helping out, you know him, you love him. It is the best dressed man on the pod. It is Daniel Sant. What's up, Dan? I'm on my Manchester shit, black tracky top and blacked out kicks. When this comes out, you'll be in the plane on your way back to the country that defeated your old country. Uh, also <laughs> helping out. It is six foot two. What you gonna do? Posse Chris. What's up, Chris? What's happening? What is happening? All right. We also got an East Coast contingent because we did not want to have a blind spot. The two thousands are too good, too important. Helping out. Pennsylvania hardcore legend Richie Crutch. What's up, Richie? What's up? Thanks for having me. You know, it was, this was a lot of fun. Yeah. Hard work, lots of fun, lots of time and effort. Mm-hmm. And also helping out. You know him. It's a Philly hardcore legend, Joe Hardcore. What's up, Joe? Thank you guys for having me. Glad to be part of this group. Yeah, man. So, oh, man. Dan, should we just start this by talking the, uh, well, let me say first, go to the website, 185milesouth.com. Click that top 100 link and you can check out the list. We already did the 70s. We did the 80s. We did the 90s. And here we are doing the 2000s. This is the decade that I feel maybe the most self-conscious about just because Every other decade, there's a lot more consensus, but every decade that goes by, every year that goes by, hardcore splinters more and more, right? In the 70s, it's like pretty straightforward punk rock. In the early 80s, hardcore starts, and there's different styles that are breaking out. In the 90s, it breaks wide open, but there's a bunch of different silos, and I feel like I could follow hardcore in all these different silos and kind of be a poser in each, you know, like, oh, I'm a power violence poser. I'm a grindcore poser. I'm a political punk poser i'm a you know whatever but you find a main lane you can kind of dabble in the others by the 2000s everything's broken wide open it's also the uh the decade when kind of regional hardcore kind of kicks a bucket right regional hardcore is still going strong in the 90s with the high speed internet in the 2000s that is kind of wiped out do you agree with that joe or no absolutely um it's the beginning of an idea that crosses you would never see somebody from like a Denver really cap up for death threat just because they made it done like two U S tours ever. But with the the bridge nine board and the outset of this kind of homogenous thinking towards this is the end all be all. It really changed the scope. I mean, cause this is when, you know, we were touring a lot and in the beginning it was like, Oh, you listen to this. We didn't even know this band existed. And by 2002 or three, everything was everywhere. And there was kind of a pecking order, not unlike this list we're going to talking about, no matter whether you were in Southern California or central Illinois or in the middle of Texas, there became just basic principle. Like these specific bands are what's great throughout the entire United States. Right. There became like a more consensus view of like, these are the biggest, the best hardcore bands. And, you know, maybe in the 80s, the 90s, you'd always, you know, stick up for your your local heroes more so. But it's, it's all the way broken open and national or international by the end of this decade. Um, okay, so everyone go to the website. You can check the list, but we will talk. Dan, you want to do the top 10 or the top 20 to lay it out for the people that are just going to listen here? Um, we can do the top 20 because I think that shows the variety. All right, also- you do... You do 20 through 11, I'll do uh, 10 through 1. Okay. But just to speak on what you and Joe were just talking about, what what's really interesting is, yes, the be- at the end of the 90s, the Rev board was huge, and then the Bridge 9 board, and it just enabled such sharing of music. But certain scenes would still have the hype. So while there was a loss of a regional sound, there was still like regional hype. 
especially in this era. Do you know what I mean? Anyway. I couldn't agree more. No matter what you couldn't top, and I saw this at Edge Day 2000, because I see, had seen Bane six months prior to that in yeah, the outset of Philadelphia suburbs, and they were still kind of newer. And then they played the 2000 Edge Day, and the entire room knew every fucking word. And I was just like, well, I have no idea what's going on right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and also we can't discount high-speed internet, right? And like the Blogspot era coming in and just being able to – and Napster – and that stuff and people being able to access everything for free, right? That's a big yeah. part of it because back before when music is fully finite, you know, and you're, you're buying physical pieces, you don't have access to everything, you know? So in the 2000s with high-speed internet, people start being able to access stuff that had been out of print forever and ever. You know, yeah, not people- everyone has like someone to be able to borrow their records and, and record them down to tape. Yeah, and people sharing even just individual tracks through AIM and all that kind of stuff. Like, wild right. time. Right. It's, it happens in this decade. Like, I remember I was living in North Hollywood in 2002 or 2003, and I didn't have high speed internet yet. And I downloaded Freebird, and it took like seven hours to download, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> longest solo ever. <laughs> I know. Like, the second half of that song kicks ass. The first half, god awful. All right, Dan, give us 20 through uh, 11. Coming in at number 20, The Suicide File, self-titled 7-inch. Number 19, Blood for Blood, Outlaw Anthems LP. Number 18, Blacklisted, Heavier Than Heaven LP. Number 17, Wisdom in Chains, Die Young LP. E-Town Concrete comes in at number 16 with The Renaissance CD. Number 15 is Ceremony, Violence, Violence, LP. Number 14, Modern Life is War, Witness, LP. 13, In My Eyes, Nothing to Hide, LP. 12, The Mighty Carry On, A Life Less Plagued, LP. Number 11, Striking Distance, March to Your Grave, LP. All right, coming at number 10, Count Me Out, the LP, 110. Number nine, hate breed perseverance. Number eight, hundred demons in the eyes of the Lord. Number seven, no warning, ill blood. Number six, American nightmare, background music. Number five, tragedy, vengeance. Number four, trapped under ice, secrets of the world. Number three, mad ball, hold it down. Number two, terror, lowest of the low. And the number one hardcore record of the 2000s, death threat, peace and security. Let me tell everyone the the way we came up with this. So basically we had us five. We all ranked our favorite 100 records or who, what we thought was the best of the 2000s. Whatever you get, we rank number one. So you rank number one through 100. Number one gets 100 points. Number two gets uh, 99 points. Number three gets 98 points, et cetera, et cetera. Number 100 gets one point. Also, because uh, I wanted to reward consensus here, basically anytime the, the second person uh, – votes on that band they got an extra five points so any band that got all five of us to vote for them they got a bonus 25 points so death threat comes in their initial total was 478 points they got a bonus 25 points they got number one with 503 points so that's how it works richie overall looking at like the the combined list what are your overall takeaways and thoughts I'm I'm just like psyched. I didn't. If you would ask me, us five, who who would come in as the number one band? I would never have thought Death Threat. I thought it was like personally. I was you know yeah. If it's my own list, they might make it up there. But seeing Death Threat just on the top of the the whole chart was really cool. Um, it, it's it's cool. The top twenty you just mentioned because some of the bands I I really I don't know much about. And then some are just, you know, I love the way this, this just worked out with the, with the method you, you went about this on. And it's really, it was just really fair and a, a smart way. But, uh, I thought for sure, cause I, you know, I listened to your podcast and I listened to Joe, I thought in my head it would have mad ball would have topped the charts. I really thought that, but when, you know, I'm not unhappy with, you know, death threat, I'm just saying. That's what I was guessing in the beginning. I was making a little bet with myself, and I thought for sure it would be Madball. But no shame in number three. No, no not at all. Three. Not at all. The whole top twenty is like that's because there's there's a lot of cool stuff going on, you know, in that decade. So 
you know, my main home. beef is that you and Joe picked the wrong E-Tone record. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that, that's the thing that gets wonky. So everyone also like the way this works is I like, so for instance, E-Town, I put second coming on my list, but because uh, Joe and Richie had uh, the Renaissance, that one beats it two to one. So E-Town concrete, the Renaissance gets my second coming points, right? So it's got that 15 uh, bonus points and it's on there. So, yeah, I mean, I don't, I honestly don't think that record's that great. I don't love it. Yeah. Um, and I love second coming. Like, I think it's like so good, you know? You so know it's, what? It's, I had, I had the same uh, issue with modern life is war. I thought, Oh, uh, you guys are picking witness. Mm. Like mine was, you know, midnight in America. That was my joint. And I think I even put mine. Let me look quick. It was, mine was in like the top. This is my number three, midnight in America. Modern life is war. <sighs> yeah. That hurts. That hurts when you have something that you love that much. And then it goes a different way. Yeah. You know, witness but- witness is dope, but like, between them, I wouldn't have expected that. Well, I gotta say, Zach tried to bribe me to put E Town on my list, so that uh, <laughs> that his pick would go. I was gonna no when it was, when it was just me and Richie because the way it works, if there's just two people of if there's two of us that have the same band but different records, whoever ranked their record higher wins. So at that time, it was just me and Richie had it. And I was like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to get Dan to put E-Town as like number 98 or something. So second coming goes, you know, on the list, you know, and then Joe comes in and puts a Renaissance as number one. And I'm like, ah, fuck it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yo, listen, the Renaissance is like out here. It's, it's highly regarded. Right, Joe? I mean, that was just like it, it to us. It made E-Town like, oh yeah, they're better than all the other bands kind of vibe. Like, you know, like maybe, you know, song wise, it was just. You know, playing it was—it was just they were on a different level, and that, I think that record proved it. Joe, you, know, you want to speak on that because that's your number one. Uh, so Richie touched on some of this, but I, I take this to a different level. Maybe you guys will understand this. The second coming era kind of proved that it wasn't the the there were in, in the discography. Obviously, Rick to Life released the first record, and then. There was this short, shady EP, which kind of when they really started taking off and playing, not just halls, but clubs. But when Second Coming came out, E-Town really kind of came into their own. But I, I believe because they worked so hard, at least on the East Coast, you they were u- ubiquitous. Like from, I, I seen them in Rhode Island. I seen them in New Hampshire. I seen them in Maryland. I've seen them in so many places in that era just from playing with other shows and just being on bills with them that I think all the work from Second Coming made them what they ended up being on the Renaissance. So during Second Coming, it was like when that record dropped, everybody wanted it because we had had so much of that material that was on the first CD in some of the demo tapes that the Second Coming material was some of the most original. Holy shit, E-Town actually has all new songs, like not any return to older stuff or rehash. Even Shady, they played live before they ever recorded at the record release because I was there at the Pipeline. So, and I'm a super E-Town mark throughout. So I think because Second Coming came out and it was so strong, I mean, they were headlining six, 700 person shows up and down the East Coast. And then they kind of started ducking down because they were playing so much, they were wearing themselves out. And when the Renaissance dropped, the production value, the songwriting, everything shifted so greatly. People were like, holy fuck, these guys leveled up. And it was also at a time that, you know, Fury of Five is now gone. Hatebreed had gone to a bigger stage. There's all these bands at a, such a bigger level that E Town was one of the only bands from the mid to late 90s in the East Coast area that were still drawing big numbers when the Modern Life is War, the American Nightmare, the Converge were really the dominant forces. They were the last bastion of the harder stuff that came from the late 90s and they were still killing it. So when Renaissance came out, people were just like blown the fuck away. So second cut without second coming and all the shows that E-Town played and headlined and try to like create like a real band sound from there's no Renaissance. Yeah, I feel that it is. It gets a little more like based around the chorus and not just like writing dynamic hardcore songs. Now to your point, I probably had more fun in the pit going off at the second coming era ever than a renaissance. I mean, in fact, the renaissance, they actually opened for edema, at least out here. I don't know if we ever made it West, 
and they started attracting the goofball Ozfest crowd to their shows, but not in big enough numbers to get really big, but just enough numbers that it went from feeling like a hardcore show when E-Town was on to a shirtless bro dude getting beat the fuck up and all of us getting kicked out. <laughs> well, yeah, I you, think- you don't have love for the push mushers, Joe? <laughs> not so much now, man. Not, not Definitely on. not then. Come on, if they pay at the door and buy a shirt, it's all love. Oh, listen, they can do whatever they want now that I'm uh, more at the door and watching than in the than in the middle of the pit. But I hated that shit then. Yeah, Chris, what are your overall thoughts on the list? Um, a couple things. One, I want to go back to um what Richie was saying about death threat. Um, because I think a, a interesting thing about this, the math of this whole thing is like none of us none of us on here actually put death threat number one, but because we had them, we all had them. And because we had them so high, like the math worked out that they came out number one, which I think is super interesting. Um, and then second, I think, you know, when I look at this list and I think back to this era, like what I'm going to say here isn't necessarily true for the people on this pod because I know everyone here kind of has a very eclectic and diverse range of tastes. And actually when I look at everyone's list, like surprisingly so, but I feel like um, the 2000s, like this decade we're talking about was kind of the era in hardcore where a lot of the walls started getting smashed down. um, And it kind of became okay for people in hardcore to like a different, uh, like a bunch of different styles of hardcore, like across you know, across the scene. Um, and, and don't get me wrong. There were plenty of, of new walls going up in, in different ways, but like, I think from a stylistic thing, like the eighties felt very rife with like this attitude of people that were kind of planting their stakes in, in the ground and saying, okay, I'm this style of hardcore kid and nothing outside of this, you know, the acceptable parameters of this label is of any value to me. And uh, that kind of seemed like an attitude that was, a lot more prevalent in uh you know in the 90s and and i i think you know maybe this is revisionist history but i think that in this day, decade that we're talking about some of that began to change and you would see like you know a band like martyr id touring with donny brook playing with reach the sky playing with you know buy a thread or whoever and and that's one of the things that kind of uh, stood out to me yeah, with the mixed tours like in the the middle of the the decade, but also we should say in the beginning of the decade, the biggest wall that gets broke down is, I think Joe, you and I talked it on your podcast, but like the label of of tough guy hardcore gets like broken down, and and Death Threat and Terror are number one and two on this list. Like I think that they're the two most important of like kind of merging, you know, like the posy kids straightforward like hardcore scene with like the scene which was like labeled like the tough guy scene right death threat peace and security coming out on bridge nine records is a huge barrier getting breaking broken down and also terror like the the merging of carry on with buried alive right and so it's like now you have a band that's like universally loved by everyone and it's like all these people should have come together in the room in the first place right like i i'll never understand this and i don't know i guess i wasn't there on the east coast of the time but like why didn't all the people that love floor punch love like the clubber lang demo? Like that demo is great. It's like short, like the song structure is the same. It's all based off like, you know, relatively straightforward New York hardcore. The songs are short, like everything's great. Like, why is that not like, why is it not in the same lexicon, you know, but it does get broken down here by death, threat and terror. So right on, that's like a, a huge barrier. This uh, broken down Dan overall thoughts on the list. Um, well, to that point, this list does skew a little tough guy hardcore, if we're going to, you know, reference that term. Um, just because we all, all five of us have uh, that over, like that kind of Venn diagram, the overlap there, we all have uh, bands that we love from what would be considered harder hardcore, you know? So the, there's a lot of like hard hitting stuff on this. If I had guessed before um, before all the lists were submitted and everything, I thought background music would have made would have been like the number one. I just uh, that would that would have been my guess that American Nightmare background music would have been number one because I thought like 
everyone would probably have it somewhere relatively high and it would have just gained all them consensus points. But I think I think the list is fantastic. I, I love the you know that it's scientific to an extent, but there are five people presenting the things. It would have been a probably a little bit of a just a little bit of a different list if like Bedge or someone else had been involved. But Bed screwed it all up by saying, oh, I, I couldn't even pick 100 records from this decade, so he has to pay the price. For- well, and he, he, was on, he was on like our 2001 Super 7, right? And he could barely fill out seven songs, so get out of here. Exactly. No, stick the troll in the ah, 80s, Ben. Ah, ah. All right, <laughs> let's, uh, let's d- jump into some of these stats here. Sorry, was someone want to speak? I was just wondering, is anyone – like not happy with or just think there's a band in the top 20 that they're just kind of like, how the fuck did that band get in that top 20 of the combined list? Oh, we keep it positive. I'm not going there. No, <laughs> Richie, what, where, what do you want to pull on that one? I, for me, it's, it's American nightmare. And cause just cause he <laughs> mentioned that, like, <laughs> uh, like I was, when he said that he thought American nightmare would be first. I was like, really? I was like, damn, man. That shit didn't even cross my mind. I'm, I'm a, surprised to see him in the top twenty, but I guess you know I was missing out on on the the uh, the the love and importance of this band at the time. What, what was your experience with them in the early two thousands? I just didn't know them one way or the other. I knew the name and the logo, but and I'm sure I played with them and seen them live. I just I don't know. They weren't in, on my radar. I guess. <laughs> well, you didn't like you didn't notice like this zeitgeist of both like energy and hype that surrounded this band like i I almost wasn't sure if they were like even a hardcore band at the time like i thought it was like kind of like you know one of these bands that was in the mix for a minute and then they're gonna gonna go do something that they want to do i I really you know i really didn't even know i'm just i would that i was surprised it was in the top 20 joe would know better if they were like i mean that was a big band around this way, right, Joe? Or yeah, and, and to to speak to that, the thing about it was, if you were there in the and, and you know, I, if you would ask me what this top twenty looks like, I would almost say that in to keep in the two thousands theme, if there was a giant CD book in someone's road trip vehicle, almost every one of these CDs would end up in uh in the road trip book. Yeah, they all fit. And they all fit for that time specifically. Why you're not getting it has more to do with the fact is, especially now, if you really like zoom out, 2000, they play their first show in Philadelphia and South Street. By 2003, they play a show at the First Unitarian Church and they act like crybabies and get off stage. And by 2004, they're broken up because they don't, they don't have their name anymore. So it, it really shifts. There was this flash in the pan where – if you were a part of the younger B9 board kind of thing, or you were younger and trying to be hip with all this other not our kind of hardcore stuff, like if Philly wasn't Philly, we would have never even caught it. But Philly ended up being like the epicenter for American Nightmare fandom. Some of the craziest shit happened in Philadelphia for American Nightmare, but as quick as it came, as quick as it was out the door. And so I could totally see you being like, oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember people knew about them things, but like they never were going to be the band that was going to hold on for 10 or 15 years because it was like a flash moment of greatness. And there was so much crazy hardcore going up in Pennsylvania, all other places that had nothing to do with American Nightmare, that it really, unless you were down in Philly and Boston and some of the other stops, they're just like even some of the New Jersey shows. I think a couple of times they played CBGBs, like there was a. CBGB's mouthpiece show that was pretty fucking crazy for them. But if you were like more into the harder stuff, you either shoot it and we're like, ah, oh, that shit sucks, or like, I don't even never seen this band before. And I remember people later on be like, oh, what's up with that American Nightmare? Like, oh, they're already they're already done. They called themselves a different name legally, and then they just said fuck it and broke up. But they were they were they were in and out pretty short as far as long term hardcore goes. So am I am I wrong for thinking like they kind of weren't in the mix of the stuff? Maybe I was into at the time. That's not right. at all. Not okay. at all. I, unless uh, there was one show down here 
in a in a church hall, and I think you were. I know it was a school hall. I think you were at it because Stick was there and everybody was there. Shadow Realm played, Punishment played, Chris Williams band played. Uh, co- that was the first time Champion came down this way, and that, that was, was like in two. Yeah, and that was in two thousand and two, and that was like the first time some of the harder dancer people were seeing American Nightmare. It was kind of like. Oh, this is cool. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, this is cool. But there was so much of our own shit going on that unless you kind of like walked in a lot of different, like went to a lot of different diverse kind of shows, you never, you could have never even caught on to that there was this band, American Nightmare, playing and killing it in places because so many of the people that were into the band, when that band left, so many of them were fucking dissipated and gone. Mm. Right. But let's talk about, the important influence of them as well. Right. So I wasn't a early adopter of American nightmare. I came to love them uh, around the time the LP comes out. So the seven inches kind of missed me and they were like blown up by then. But I think what makes them so unique is a lot of the bands that are playing like, you know, semi straightforward, fast, hardcore in the late nineties. And around this time, like it, some of it starts sounding a little safe and a little stale. And American Nightmare comes out. The vocals are completely shredded and just blasted. yeah, cacophonous as hell. Cacophonous right. as hell, like ripped up vocals that you didn't really hear in hardcore at the time. Right, and the drum beat is just a tick faster, like a tiny tick faster than like bands that are coming out doing double time. Do that, let do that, let do that, let do that. American Nightmare is just a tick faster. Do that, let do that, let do that. You know, and those two combined, I was just like, you know, I don't love this. But I do love the idea that something so abrasive to the ear is like on top right now, like Mm. actually like something that, you know, like a normal civilian like would listen to. And it just sounds like noise is actually popular instead of like, you know, the band's trying to go a little more melodic or a little more safe to the ear. Like they're the popular one. It's like, oh, this crazy sounding band is like the the popular one. Like that's kind of cool. I mean, that's what I took from it. Dan, what did you take from it? So I saw them at a Saturday matinee in Philadelphia with Voorhees from the UK and a mixed bill. And I, everyone was like, dude, you got to check this out. And we knew everybody from tenure fight. And even Wes, we knew because he was down when they would play. And what I saw rich was like people who would kind of stand around with their arms folded literally losing their minds. And there was a group of younger people that were all coming in the shows and trying to do fast stuff. And they all looked at American nightmare. Like that was Holy shit. This is what everybody, because the late, the late nineties stuff was kind of like rehashed third rate chain of strength and everybody trying to keep whatever that vibe going. And it was just failing. And American nightmare came in with what he's at. What we were talking about really raw, aggressive vocals, really, really fast beats, and it really changed the entire platform if you were going from, as you said earlier, with the floor punch things. A lot of fans from floor punch either were like, oh, I hate the way these people dress. And why is everybody talking about new wave? This band sucks. Or the people that still really liked fast, aggressive, hardcore jumped on because American Nightmare was playing with Kill Your Idols and Vision and all these bands that were still around from the end of the 90s. Yeah. Dan, what do you see the importance of American Nightmare? Well, it it's I mean, you've you've addressed what it is sonically, like how they sound, but they also brought like an absolute rawness to what we could now term as like mental health related issues within hardcore, like um channeling like lots of the old factory record stuff, especially Joy Division, but also through Wes's incredible lyricism. And then also when you saw them live, they had these open gate like pedals that would keep noise going while they all tuned, got ready for the next song and just ripped into it. And it just was a well thought out, like amazing presentation of, ha- of the chaos that they were live sometimes. When they were on, they were one of the best bands you've ever seen live. And I, I take into point like what Joe said about them later on, it being a bit more like hard work for them. And then the passion like waned when it became like more hard work. But this time that this LP came out, 
it was just this fucking meteor. Like they were a band that was just in their prime when you saw them nail it. Like it's one of the best, you know, they're up there with some of the best ever hardcore bands like performing live. Yeah, and also Joe, you know, you talking about like E Town, all that stuff, like laying the the groundwork for the Renaissance. Like, it's pretty gnarly for a hardcore band like American Nightmare to do. They do two seven inches, right, Dan? Before yeah, LP? Yeah. yeah, two seven inches that people like love and is changing the game, and then they come out with an LP that delivers. You know, like you would think that like because this is before bands are doing like multiple LPs. Right, like how many hardcore bands in the history of hardcore have done three great LPs? It's like a pretty small. It's impossible. Number. It's impossible. The third's like the the jinx of all. You guys could do a whole podcast. You guys should do a whole podcast on the third record jinx because sure. it's a it's a phenomena in, in all rights and exactly to your point. And I think it also addresses a weird thing that is not really present in the two thousands, which is the control of hardcore through Victory Records. You know, with the with the background music, with the Death Wish with the Thorpe records and the striking distance and with martyr smaller or newer labels were able to press out these, these seven inches and these LPs and really kind of take back the DIY more grounded hardcore and hardcore record labels. And I think that's a huge reason where American nightmare flourished was by being an East coast band put out by an East coast dude who was at every show slipping seven inches out. And I think the progress was made background music is definitely fit to be in the top 20. And I, I think I put it at number six just because of its impact in hardcore. And I feel like sometimes bands ought to go out after the first one, when they put out something like that and their legacy is pretty well set just in the first four years of their band. And it's only when they start playing with Places like, in, for instance, one of the last times we saw them, they played in Pennsylvania where a venue had a strict no stage diving policy. And we ended up in a crazy thing with the whole venue over it and the security and whatever. But that band was made for small stages, no barricades, and the full chaos of what hardcore is. And I think as they grew, I don't think they ever would have managed to have that same kind of energy coming out if they were touring like let's say if they wanted to do the warp tour or if they took like a full US with a chemical romance and no barricades the band would have been ca- like trapped in a cage and it would the energy would have been there that's fair okay i want to jump back to the list here so let's go into the bands that had five votes so these are bands that all of us voted for and they ended up all real high first off just want to say all all top five, all five of us voted for. So that's super sick. There's a lot of consensus here. Um, number one, Death Threat. We all did Death Threat pieces of security. Uh, the number two on the list, Terror, Lois, Low. Four of us went Lois, Low. One of us went Always the Hard Way. Uh, number three on the list, Madball, Hold It Down. We all picked the same record. Number four, Trapped Under Ice, Secrets of the World. We all picked the same record. Number five, Tragedy Vengeance is on there. Three of us went Vengeance, one of us went Self-Titled, and one of us went Nerve Damage. Mm. Number seven, No Warning, Ill Blood. All of us took that. Number eight, Hunter Demons, In the Eyes of the Lord. Uh, Three of us took In the Eyes of the Lord, and two took Self-Titled. Number nine, Hatebreed, Perseverance, all took that. Number 11, Striking Distance, March to Your Grave. Two people took March to Your Grave, and one took, oh, excuse me, two took the Self-Titled 7-inch, two (laughs) took March to Your Grave, and one took the fuses lit. Uh, number 15, Ceremony. Everyone took Violence, Violence. And then number 34, Down to Nothing, The Most. Four took The Most. One took Unbreakable. Uh, thoughts on this, Richie? What, the the bands that we all chose. You know, my biggest surprise of I thought I was going to, I don't know why I thought this, but I thought I would be uh, the only guy with with the love for tragedy like that like putting them that high. That was a surprise to me. Maybe just out of ignorance, I didn't realize, you know, uh, that, that, that album was, uh, so big to you guys as well. But, uh, other, other than that, I don't think I had any big surprises. I give you the American nightmare surprise in reverse, but Mm -hmm. the other side surprise that, you know, like what I thought was really good, but I didn't think anyone else was on. It was that tragedy. And then when you just gave that stat about, 
a, you know, a lot of us picking even different albums. That's, that's a pretty cool sign for, for them. I think. I think that like with this group of people we have here, like no one's been into hardcore for less than 25 years, mm. you know? And, and like with that comes a little bit of us liking multiple types of hardcore, you know, like maybe if you, if you surveyed someone that was, you know, in and out in five years, even 10 years, like they might not dabble in everything, but God, I mean, tragedy comes out in, you know, that first LP, I think is the year 2000 and God, such a game changer, you know? Mm. So gnarly. Um, okay. Highest band with four votes was American nightmare. Background music comes in at number six. And I should say I fucked up and I f- totally forgot Bane. So they should be on the bands with five votes. So that's my bad. Um, you know, looking at my list, they would have ended up, uh, I mean, top 50 for sure. So that kind of screws them a bit. Bane still comes in at number 23 on the list. But even if I ranked them number 50, they're going into the top 15. So that's that's kind of a bummer. They still get number 25. They also should have been on that consensus where we all choose it. Okay. Uh, highest band with three votes. E-Town Concrete, the Renaissance, coming in at number 16. The highest band with two votes uh, is Ringworm. Birth is Pain comes in at number 41. The highest band with one vote, Lars Fredrickson and the Bastards, their LP Viking. And Richie, that must have been way high on your list. It comes in at number 90. Yeah. So you guys don't dig that album? It just missed I couldn't me. Put it in the, I couldn't put it in the top 100, but... It was a list of punk and oi stuff that I was really listening to at the time. Not even the top hundred it couldn't make. Dude, I'm gonna I don't know if I ever listened to that record before this, which is disappointing because Did you check it out since? No, but I will. It's on it's on on my I think it's great. it's like so many it's just it's it just flies by so many styles of uh of of songwriting in there. Like even like there's like a ballad track on it. It's just I think it's like a great album. I'll check it out because I love Rancid and we we sing the praise of Rancid lots on this pod. So, okay. The lowest band that had five votes uh, is down to nothing at number 34, the LP the most. And the lowest with four votes is Foundation, the Hang Your Head EP that came in at number 71. Also, the first 23 records on the list are all LPs. The highest ranked uh, seven inch or EP is Limp Wrist coming in at number 24, the What's Up With The Kids 7-inch. Um, also just wanted to make quick note, the bands that just missed the list, so number 101, 102, and 103. Number 101 was Coke Bust, uh, their record Lines In The Sand. It got three votes. Number 102, Billy Club Sandwich, Superheroes At Leisure came in with two votes. And 103, The Casualties, Die Hards, it got one vote. Joe did it as number 42. So it almost made the list. Um, mm. Let's talk our number ones real quick. I took Mabba, hold it down. Richie, you also took that. Yeah. Um, it is the fourth Mabba record, maybe their best record. I think that if, if set it off, didn't have so much sentimental value to me, hold it down would probably be their best record. But, you know, I love set it off so much, but hold it down, dude. Talk on that record a little bit. Hold it down is uh, that's my personal favorite from Madball, and that's you know that it's just key. It's raw. It it's yeah. Set set it off like it sounds. It it, it sounds like almost hold it down should be their their debut album. You know, it's like more raw than it's more raw, more simple than set it off somehow. But it's just like the lyrics are there. The bounce is there, and and the the style of recording just just caught me. It's such a great record. I thought, you know, I thought for sure that was going to be number one, but uh, hey, the Death Threat stole that shit. They came in out of nowhere. They knocked Madball in the head and said, "Move out of the way." Bam! They jumped in that slot. But I mean, it hold it down is key key to me, and I'm glad. Like, how many number ones you had? Uh, two, me and you. Yeah. That's great, though. That's great. You can't ask for more than that. Dan, you took Count Me Out 110 as your number one. Speak on that record. Um, it's perfect hardcore. Like, it's absolutely perfect hardcore. Um, it's aggressive, has a bit of melody, it's fast, 
the vocals are aggressive and uh, audible and the recording is top notch the layout top notch i love count me out hell yeah chris i blew it by not shooting the american nightmare conversation you apparently because you are the one that put it number one speak on it yeah well first on count me out uh it, the interesting thing about, I guess, the way that the approach that I took on this is like, I this isn't my personal favorite, like number one, number two, you know, like this isn't, if I was to make a list of my, um, like certainly my favorites are, are part of the equation, um, but American Nightmare wouldn't be my favorite if I had to put in there, it'd be top 10 probably, but um, it probably would have been, you know, carry on or count me out. But I think for me like <laughs> i didn't have a, like a, like a specific equation in my head or anything but like how much i love american nightmare and how much uh just what they i guess the energy that they brought to hardcore um and and the staying power for like fans of it um it, is kind of what put them at number 1 for me i think you guys all spoke on uh, like a number of the the important factors, but I think a couple of things you guys didn't hit on are like, I think the presentation, Dan touched on it a little bit, like the, the, uh, the audio presentation, but like their aesthetics were, you know, they certainly cultivated an, as, an aesthetic. And, you know, a lot of that had to do with Linus Garcia's art, which w- I like was popping, like, you know, American Nightmare really kind of like set the stage for Linus to get a lot of work, which is awesome for him. Um, but, you know, his art certainly w- was a big part of that as well as, you know, for better or for worse, like the mod haircuts and the track jackets and, you know, the D- Joy Division shirts, like there was certainly like a a visual um, impact that was felt from this band as well. And then they were just like, you know... It, as Joe pointed out, they, it wasn't like, you know, they weren't touring this whole decade, but when they were going strong, like they were pretty powerhouse touring act for, I don't know, three years, four years, um, specifically in the Northwest where it's really hard to get up to the Northwest because it's so far out of the way of, um, I mean, we've all done that drive. It sucks. Um, but you know, they, they were a band that came to the Northwest a few times, like over the course of a few years. And I think, you know, from a Northwesterners perspective, like any band that comes to the Northwest more than once or twice, uh, certainly gets a lot of respect and love. And, um, you know, that impression like, wow, these guys are powerhouses on the, on the road. But, um, I think a lot of those things kind of play into like me putting them number one. Yeah. That's a difficult thing. Like figuring out how to balance, making a list like this, right? Because you are balancing merit versus your personal favorites. Um, Joe, how do you attack doing that? I went with, at least with the top 10, things that I can live with, someone walking up to me after hearing this podcast and not wanting to smack someone in the fucking mouth. (laughs) So the first 10 is all records that, if you got a problem with, we got hands. And then from there, it's either stuff that I really did truly listen to and really vibe with at the time, or I could also say, and after 20, it was records that absolutely people would be like, this is definitely should have made the list because I can cognizantly say that I was at, I can't even tell you how many American Nightmare shows. I was actually, there's a show at the Kill Time with American Nightmare and Count Me Out. And for a minute, I'm like, yo, American Nightmare not be able to play after this band. And then when they played, I'm like, nah. AN really is that band. Like I've seen so many of these bands and yeah, it wasn't Ninja kick everyone getting a fight kind of hardcore, but I love the atmosphere. I love being in the shows. I love just the whole chaos of it, which is why I ended up loving tragedy, seeing them in some shitty place in Philly and just being like the chaos of it drew me more than the actual lyrical content or the, you know, the cool factor of the guys in these bands. So the first top 10 legitimately, these are records that I know front and back, left and right. And the, everything else was either stuff I really enjoyed or things that I knew cognizantly had a place in the 2000s and it deserved. So the number status might be a little bit wonkier from 21 plus. When it comes to Madball, hold it down. I was just happy that all the people like Sweet Pete and in my eyes stopped liking Madball by that time. 
because I was a kid when Set It Off was out and it was a very scary hardcore scene. And then Look My Way showed up and all these posy dudes started loving Madball and it really fucked the whole vibe up. <laughs> so by mm-hmm. Madball hold it down, all the herbs with the crew cuts and good looking hair gave up and Madball went back to a really raw style. Uh, unfortunately, I think the only reason why Hold It Down doesn't get as much love is Freddie went away and the band kind of broke up after that and were kind of out of the picture until that 7-inch came out on Thorpe. But it, the only reason why I didn't make my number one is because I fucking E-Town Renaissance is that record for that time period, at least in the tri-state here. Like when that record came out, yeah, there was American Nightmare, was Converge. Every person, every show, people were either playing that damn um, mandibles or the so many nights outside of their car. Like, when the fuck does hardcore people listen to hardcore music in a parking lot? But that shit was going on even outside of positive numbers, Chris and Dan. Don't say it didn't happen because I was there. <laughs> Watch it happen. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of how I went with my list. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Dan, how did you attack your list? And, and was this decade different for you than doing uh, all the other decades? Um, yeah, I feel like doing this, it's just when I was like at a show literally every night, like for the first five years of this decade, for sure. Um, and then had a little bit of a drop off and came back harder a couple of years before the decade ended. Um, so there is a little bit of a, of a 2007, 2008, like, I didn't get as deep into my like ravenous appetite for hardcore as much around that time. But what I will say is the way I attacked my list is I just did my favorites. And then when I realized I couldn't avoid having like one of the most monstrous records of the decade, not acknowledged yet. So then I put in converge at number 48, Jane Doe, um, because like at at that point I'd done like all my personal faves because, you know, I know this is going to consensus anyway. So I'm trying to give the stuff I really loved like that time in the sun and hope it, you know, does get consensus and does make it on the greater list. And then by about, you know, the halfway point is when I start acknowledging, you know, a few things on there that are just important for the general conversation of the decade. But for the most part, I feel like I'm lockstep with a lot of what was um, different, different like heaters throughout the decade, like different, like almost like sound trends within hardcore at the time. you like, uh, I definitely have a very wide list and and it's uh, pretty much all over the decade but obviously it's going to skew a little bit to the earlier thing because I was touring and seeing a lot more bands and just buying records left right and center which I still am but uh you know the one thing that I feel my list has that doesn't necessarily reflect on many of the other lists is like that kind of hardcore well i mean for lack of better term like the locking out stuff so the bands that would go back historically and like you know love this one song by warzone or this outburst seven inch or whatever and then kind of do bands built around that sound in a in a a take of what the sound was also in the scene and like this hybrid like retro loving hardcore was like built that had a lot of bounce and vibe and and like visual aesthetic and stuff i really ate all that up because it's just so fun and and you know i love i it's why hold it down is really really high on my personal list i i think i had it at number four um, because I love bounce in hardcore. I love a real groove. I mean, don't forget the struggle. Don't forget the streets. It's one of my favorite LPs of all time. And and lots of these bands that are on my list, like Stop and Think, Dump Truck, Mental, 
all of them righteous jams like they were all like referencing this you know that kind of bounce and groove that was in uh hardcore from the past so i think that shows up a lot on my list if if you're like a i don't know a generic casual hardcore kid do you think that chris you can take this do you think that we low rated bane and converge and have heart like if i'm looking at this list and i'm thinking about consensus beyond us five maybe those are low bane at 23 have heart at 29 and let's see converge at 33 do you think they're unfairly low um, I don't think they're unfairly low. I think it's just kind of the, how the algorithm works. Um, you know, I think an interesting, an interesting piece of this exercise, and I don't know if this necessarily relates here, but like, if there's a specific record that grabs you, like that can impact, like, like if there's a, a record from a band that grabbed me in, you know, 99 and then that rec- that band has a record that comes out in 2003. Maybe I don't listen to the record in 2003 as much as I listened to the one in 90, you know, whatever I the earlier one I said was, because it's, I, I keep going back to the other one or, or, you know, maybe the other way around, like something that, um, you know, like I'm looking, I'm looking at the list here and Joe has uh, that Reach the Sky record, um, the second Reach the Sky record, which is a great record, but like for me, I always go back to the one before that. And so I didn't listen to that one a ton. Um, another good example is Retaliate. Like Retaliate's a band that I love. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, sorry to do this, Zach. But, like, uh, it just hurt me. <laughs> retaliate. I didn't take any other. Reta- I didn't take Retaliate on this list because what for me, good. when I really kind of fell with in love with Retaliate was in uh, when thorns came out which was uh you know in the next decade and so um you know by the time i got around to checking out these other records uh i i would listen to it and i'd be like yes this is all really good but i'm gonna go back to thorns um so it's an interesting dynamic i guess it doesn't really answer your question but i think you know to answer your question specifically about like the stuff that you know is converge low rated or you know, have heart or whatever. It's just kind of how the math works, you know, like everyone has what is personally their favorites and, and that is the stuff that they high rate. And, um, you know, there, there's different people that are, that have different tastes that aren't, you know, us five people. I, I, I can't remember what magazine it, it was. I was, I was trying to look it up. Um, like Revolver or so- something like that. Like one of those big magazines recently put out a, you know, best records of the 2000s era. And, and you know, the person that, that wrote that record clearly likes a very, very different style of hardcore than, you know, the five of us on here do. And and I say that not to like disparage their list. Like I don't, I didn't look at that rest list and say, oh, that's a horrible I'll list. I'll disparage that list. <laughs> uh-huh. I, I just kind of looked at it and said, okay, I know the kind of person that wrote this list and it's not necessarily like um, the style of hardcore that I love. So like, you know, I didn't really take any, anything personal towards it, but <laughs> it's kind of how I view like our list. Like I think there's, there's not certainly- view our list, like any of those fucking lists, dude, that's the whole point of this, right? It's like, I, I've read those articles for my entire lifetime of liking music, you know, going back to, you know, being in fifth grade and reading like the best 50 heavy metal records of the eighties or some shit, you know? And it's like every fucking list sucks. You know what I mean? And so like, I'm trying to make our list not suck. And that's why I'm not making my own list, right? I, we made our own list. We stand behind our lists. All our individual lists are posted on the website. You can go look at them. Right. But for like this 185 mile South podcast, what we're putting out is this combined list, right? What I'm doing is I'm, choosing people that I like and respect their opinion about hardcore. And then we're building a consensus together. So hopefully there's, we're putting out something that is like better than Joe Schmo doing his best 20. And cause what, what they're doing is they're balancing what they think people want and like, what's going to get a click. Right. And mm-hmm. we're balancing merit and personal love. 
And so like, I think we're coming from like a much more honest place. I don't know. Joe, yeah, you want to handle that? No, we lived, also... Just to say that we lived this, like, this is not right. like us looking back and doing some homework and being like, Oh wow. These guys made a difference back then. No, we lived it. Like a lot of those lists that I see, I'm like, those, these dudes that wrote this, they weren't around. They weren't checking. There's no way that this is what they would come up with if they existed in that time. It's just a look back. It was on the label at the moment that people are, you know, talking about now. It's it's like a revisionist. You know what I mean? But right. I'm sorry. I cut you off there, Joe. Go ahead. No, Joe. no, no. That's fair. That's fair. Joe, I want you to take that, and I also want you to, to talk on, do you think that we low-ranked those three bands, Converge, Half Heart, and Bane? If you zoom out. To a 22, 22, 2022 perspective here, Bane had a hold on a demographic in hardcore. And although that was heavily present at these very big festivals and in the East Coast, I have friends who were like, didn't even really fuck with them till the end of the 2000s. They started playing this hardcore. Like, yo, these motherfuckers are good. Remember Ray Ray, first time he came to this hardcore. Like, yo, these guys are fucking good. Yeah. Like, sometimes. And Dan spoke on it pretty well. They're, that locking out crowd had so many great bands and great songs and great seven inches. And I've seen them in basements and places all around here. And I, with the exception of um, Righteous Jams, a lot of them had one or two times that I would ever see them and they never would come back. So I don't really place a high presence in my personal perspective on the 2000s, but they have a place within it. So it's like, yeah, Jane Doe is a fucking fantastic record for Converge, but I'll tell you what, it's stuff on other records that were go people were still going off for as the hardcore scene. You know, like Converge really transcended hardcore when they came out with that and they became something beyond the underground while still always being a part of our underground. But the metal the, the metal people had to finally ex uh, like respect them because of the prestige of that record and playing and all the things that come from it. So it's important that those bands get acknowledged. Well, the third band uh, brought up was Have Heart. I give no love to Have Heart. I mean, good record, but yo, you were in and out in three fucking years. Yeah, you but know? they and, 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 and they, they played, were they played the biggest hardcore show of all time, though, Joe. Right? They didn't play no fucking hardcore show. They played to an algorithm based fandom that was created post hominously <laughs> because Bridge Nine, because Bridge Nine, post that record created an algorithm on Spotify, which isn't a mute media player. It's a social media platform. And so what happens is mm. if I go ahead and I release crutch and all the hardest shit in the 1990s, and then I re-release all these pop punk things coming afterwards, the fandom that is connected through bridge nine in the uh, algorithmic created a scenario where all these herbs who were not even going to hardcore shows in 2004, <laughs> five and six, are now super fans of a band they've never seen play when they do a reunion and having seen half heart in front of nobody with well, the first time they really came through Philly, having booked a show at killing time, half heart and verse in 2007, and only 300 persons were there. And then them breaking up uh, auspiciously because they said, well, we just toured with Bane and you know, we don't want to end up looking like those guys only to return to do a reunion to 10,000 people, all of which were mostly not hardcore kids, but pop punk people. I don't consider it a hardcore show. It's a big fucking barricade and goofiness. But whenever there's a reunion, there's money. And I cannot say that I haven't been a part of that. So I'm not disparaging for reuniting. But I, I personally, from looking at the social media of all the people that went to that first big show, that looked like Warp Tour V3, like the return of. So I, I wouldn't call Have Heart that overall important to the 2000s at a wide angle lens of all the things that were going on. They had two records that I think my friend Jeff still hasn't sold out of. And then they have a record that algorithmically is supported. But when they were playing, they weren't selling a thousand person rooms out. And that needs to be said. It, it, it's hard to look at something like how people worship bands from the 1980s, but were not born at that time. If you look at the time when Have Heart was playing, they were dope. And I'll tell you what, I've seen some crazy shit at a couple of their sets, but they were not the penultimate hardcore band. It's only in hindsight and with the balance of all these pop things that came in that also sound a lot like it, 
But that record was shit on by hardcore kids because Foundation was popping up. And all this shit that was coming out of United Blood was like, ah, oh, this have hearts all right, but this shit is crazy. And so the, the, the difference is what's actually in play live in the 2000s isn't going to look right in 2022. Yeah. Bane should have went a little bit higher up because Bane played with a lot of different things, but they also weren't. I mean, Bane might have played with Manball in Europe, maybe a couple times in New England, but it took later on for Bane to kind of like be something that everybody in hardcore knew because there was so much going on with their own label and Equal Vision and the bands that they play with. Even though we talked about earlier in the homogeny of hardcore, there was still plenty of these pockets where like tra- Tragedy never played with Manball, Limpress did never played with Manball, Rambo never played with Manball. Everyone was aware, of, not everybody, but most people aware of all these bands, but there is, wasn't such a time with so much activity of everybody traveling and everybody booking their own tours. Not every band crossed over and played shows in America. It's kind of weird that so much crazy shit was popping up at that time. And yet all it was kind of like a pocket universe. So you'd play Texas and you might know what this is, like Far From Breaking. But people who knew, unless they were local, might not put together that Far From Breaking is a part of the same hardcore scene as Will To Live and Pride Kills. Right. You know, like there still is like this regional thing. So I don't think they got underwrote. I think if you really fucked with Bane, you're going to fuck with Bane. I mean, and if you didn't fuck with them, no one would have walked up to you in hardcore like, are you fucking crazy for not knowing them? Because there was tons of shit going on. It was actually one of the best times because there was so much still going on because it was pre the internet. Really dominating people, not having to go to shows to be a part of our scene. Emission and presence was still the end all be all. You couldn't sit on a, s- a social media platform you couldn't go and make a YouTube channel. You couldn't go on Twitter. You couldn't have these high ideals about what was going on in our scene because you had to fucking be there with your own eyes. And so nowadays it's a lot easier to have these like armchair quarterbacks rewriting history or specifically pontificating by eliminating specific admissions to what a top 10 list should be. I think our own pr- pr- perspectives are felt on this list. I was love watching you guys come in and you guys gave me some reminding thoughts like, oh yeah, that record actually was really cool. And to talk about what Chris said, yeah, sometimes a different record would come in. Mm-hmm. Like Reach the Sky was insanely important in this area and New, and New England. So although I probably listened to the first record more, they were very present in this area. So I didn't want to not have them be mentioned because of what they were for our area in hardcore. And so with this list, sometimes it might have been the 90s records that I popped more, but I'm not going to uh, omit them from the 2000s because, again, that second record, they were still playing tons of shows on. And, and that live experience and that presence in our scene played heavy dividends. And it, and again, I booked Have Heart. I, I liked them as a band. They had a moment. But again, uh, if you're not doing this all the time or like – if you're not a Vogel, you're not a death threat, you're not a Chris Williams, you're not these people that stay with this shit. You do your three or four years and then you go off and you do something else. It's cool that you did it, but we're not going to build no fucking shrine to you. Yeah, but let me push back slightly on that. Cause Please I, do. Because I fully, I, I'm in your camp with it. Have Heart really haven't mattered to me. But one thing that is interesting is if if you think about a record as a piece of art and it is consumed later and later on and becomes one of those maybe tentpole releases for a decade in in its you know sub substance beyond while the band was around do you know what i mean like we've we just talked background music ad nauseum the way it looks the way the lyrics are are written and the way it's presented it is something that lives beyond its time of that band being amazing for you know three years same with you know to some people this have heart record has meant the world to them now i have it very low on my list and uh it's nothing that i've really go to to listen to ever now but i do recognize that it was um you know a very important record for a lot of people but i think it has grown in its death being 
but to me, my personal view on it is they were just loving what Bane did and did their own take on what Bane was. Now, Aaron Bedard's voice is a lot harder for the average average kid in the street to wrap their head around, whereas Pat Flynn's voice is maybe a lot easier for them to wrap their head around. So for me, Have Heart is Bane Light, but for a lot of people who like, and, and I think you did an excellent job describing what half of that crowd, because definitely hardcore kids from all over the world flew to go to that show. So that record has mattered massively to people, but the other side of it is absolutely nailed on what you said, which is um, lots of hipsters <laughs> have discovered this band through um, algorithms and and you know recommendations and whatever, but it doesn't stop the fact that this record has meant something to them. Do you know what I, I, mean? gotta, I also, I also, I'll give you, I gotta, Joe, real quick though. I think that we shouldn't discount also, you know, you, you saying they drew 300 kids, not a thousand kids drawing, you know, 300 kids in the mid two thousands on a, a half with killing time is pretty and verse good. with killing time with verse killing time verse. It just, there was a, there was people who liked them, but mm-hmm. they weren't buying the ticket. That's all I'm saying. Right. Yeah. Fair. And, and, and in 2006, they turned down playing this hardcore to play Baltimore. So I booked them the Monday after and they played mm-hmm. it for 75 people. So they were still growing when that record was produced and it took later. Now I'm going to give you this basic, simple numerical reason why I think so. Bad Brains, $17 million for Band in D.C. No one will argue that the song most people would go to for Bad Brains is Band in D.C. $2,200,000 and plus is for a song called Pave Paradise, which is songs that scream the sun. Arm with a mind and life is hard enough. Arm with mind has $2.2 million, and then life is hard enough has 800000 Almost every record with this songs to scream at the sun has almost 2 million listens versus the record when they were playing a shit ton, like the record that really was the record for them in hardcore. Only one of the songs hits 2 millions on Spotify. Spotify is an algorithm based social media platform. It's, it has created a scenario where there's 102,000 monthly listeners for have heart, a band who previous to their demise wasn't selling out 700 or 1200 person rooms all the time. And yet we go to American nightmare who we all agree factually better impact huge. And their number, the one song that has a million plays is a record that came out in 2019. And the most, uh, the biggest song from their big record is 500,000 and they rank only 24,000 monthly listeners. Unfortunately, we can never use lists like this and put them up against what we're now dealing with, which is a algorithm-based world where suggestions to the outside non-hardcore people can come in, observe, and consume our culture. And then it's good when a guy like Pat Hart, have Hart who still does bands, they're just not hardcore bands, gets the love and support that he should have probably got when he did that fucking record. Because that fucking record and that song "Arm with the Minds" out of outrageously good. What I'm saying is, is we can't pat them on the back for a reunion because a bunch of people from the pop punk world, because Chris started releasing pop punk records, made Have Heart popular with people who would never have seen them at the first Unitarian Church with Killing Time. That's my only point. And if you I look like- at and you look at these algorithm numbers, you got twenty four thousand monthly viewers or uh, monthly listeners. For a band, American Nightmare, that was way huger. Or I can't, that's not even a real word. How fucking hood is that? <laughs> and you have a hundred, who's a hundred thousand people listen to Have Heart every month? Right. But the, and, but the that's, Have Heart, thing, the have heart thing did convert though. People showed up, right? Yeah, and so, they showed up. But what I'm saying is, is it is easy to click a button and be a fan in 2022 or when was that reunion? 2017, 18. It was not easy to show up 
pay for a ticket. And, and Dan actually brought up a good point because there were bands who did not have great singing voices. But at the time when Bane was ripping ass, they didn't have a great voice. And Bane was doing pretty well for themselves, playing some pretty big rooms when Have Heart was still growing on a hardcore scene. At the time, Have Heart was not where they are at post ominously is my point. And the people who brought them into the fandom were never hardcore people for the most part, because there isn't a hundred thousand hardcore people listening to all these other bands. But rooms are always filled by casuals, right? So not, I don't know. Not I don't, that many. I don't know. I don't know if the percentage changes too much. You know, if there's 7,000 people there, there's X percentage of, of casual people compared to, you know, when 200 people show up. Like it's, I'll, it's I'll always, de- I'll always, I'll always fight back and say it's a pop bunk <laughs> fandom that made anyone give a fuck about them. Well, that's why it's, we love you, Joe. Can but, I can I add one thing on on them real quick? Yeah, I I don't disagree. Uh, any of this discussion on uh, like the playlist uh, pop for for them and and some other bands, I do think though, like you know, and, and Joe's not like advocating against this because I believe Joe, you have them on your list, but. Yeah, they're, um, they're definitely on my list. I, I mean, I booked I think, them a bunch. I, I think see the them place, a bunch. I like them. <laughs> I think the place that Have Heart has is like they were a great band, great live, uh, you know, translated on record. They were a straight edge hardcore band that for the course of maybe three years, they were probably the biggest straight edge hardcore band in the country. Like, would you would you disagree with that? Disagree. Really? Who do you th- who yeah. do you think would be bigger at that time? I might be forgetting someone. Bigger, like I mean, straight edge hardcore band. Were they playing straight edge hardcore, or were they straight edge dudes playing hardcore? I would say both. I don't know. I've seen a lot of kids who were straight edge hardcore bands that were killing it in the locking out world that were shitting on bands like Have Heart and Bane, who were also had straight edge members. So I think at the two thousands, it was still that kind of my circle, my friends versus you and your friends. You know what I mean? There was a lot of pettiness that was still in all them little different pocket scenes you know sure but would you would you say that there was a bigger straight edge hardcore band like during have hearts and i'm not saying there's not i I just can't think of someone like in that era they're post champion right chris yeah i would say champion (laughs) champion was fucking big as fuck the post champion is them who broke up i mean i think they were bigger than us they kind of started up? popping after we broke up, and I think they got. You guys broke up what in 06 or 07? 06. Yeah, so they they had their last big pop in 07. So they probably just came right after it. It's hard to say because I think that there was a huge amount of kids who were just straight edge. There was the mm-hmm. posi numbers world and the locking out world, and then there was the I love straight edge hardcore that's fast and weird from Europe, but mm-hmm. I ain't going to no Moss show that's this. Like, yeah. there was a lot of pretension. <laughs> so, you, you can't really get a good number on it. And sure. I mean, there were still tons of people that were actually fucking with bands like Infest and all these mm-hmm. like uh, faster stuff that was more from, let's say, ABC No Rio crowd versus CBs that you don't see now. You don't see as many of the ABC No Rio bands getting loved in the 2022s like they did in the 2000s. You know, like I think there there's a lot of people that cognizantly were like still fucking with bands from the eighties that now wouldn't. Um, but yeah, I guess maybe they were they, I have a shirt that says have heart straight edge, so maybe have heart. But I I I I, I would also say I've seen Righteous Jams play some wild ass shows in Philly and Boston that looked a lot crazier than Have Heart. So who the fuck knows? Are you satisfied, Chris? Uh I mean, yeah. I guess I, I I disagree. I just I just think they you know for the at least you've seen them. You've seen them in you've seen them way more than I did outside of Philadelphia, yeah. Boston, and Maryland. So you would have yeah. a much wider viewpoint than me. So I would always say you have a better perspective, and your mileage would totally be dominant because I aside from seeing them, let me see New Jersey, Maryland, New York. Massachusetts. That's the only places I've ever seen them. So you you did tours with them. So you might have seen some stuff in these places to get a better perspective. But for me, I I think they're a cool band. I think the algorithm helps a lot of bands post ominously and ignore other bands. Mm -hmm. If you look at there's bands now that literally exist. The young bands are coming out that worry about what Spotify Spotify subscriber numbers they have. And it's like, look, if if your if your band that's playing for fifty people has the same amount of subscribers as American Nightmare, throw that number out the fucking window and just keep playing. 
Yeah. I mean, when, you know, when we talk about the algorithm, have heart, like you said, was not playing to a thousand kids a night. And this, you know, this was before that. Or they wouldn't have broke up. (laughs) (laughs) But, but they would play to, you know, on the West coast, the bigger, the, you know, the A, the A markets, they'd play to, you know, three to 400 kids on, in the small town scenes, they would play to 80 to a hundred, which is pretty damn impressive for a straight edge hardcore band. But well, yeah, and we also shouldn't say like that they're that low ranked, right? It's number twenty nine out of an entire yeah. decade, right? It's just I, with those three bands stand out to me. Like if if your average kid was making a list, you could easily see Bane, Have Heart, Converge being top ten. So that was absolutely just I wanted to touch on. I also think with your list, there's not a single band in the top twenty that didn't play on the road. Maybe Carry On didn't tour as much as Count, and count Me Out. Maybe didn't do that many tours. But, I mean, Ceremony made the list, and they didn't even really start touring until 2006, but their impact was so big. Same thing for Modern Life is War. They were in the later half of the decade, and they toured a lot. I think a lot of this still shows that you either have to have a big regional pop, like Count Me Out, Wisdom of Chains, E-Town Concrete, you know, like, Suicide File, I know they toured a bunch, but then they stopped playing for a while. And then we had them in 2009 at This Is Hardcore. But a lot of these bands were played played on the road enough that people would know them regardless. Mm. So I don't think that they were, I don't think they were, I don't think Have Heart, Bane, or the other record, or Jane Doe was disregarded. I think it just comes down to what you did with the numbers and our personal preferences. I think, I think that's an interesting discussion there. Like, um, these are all, for the most part, bands that worked really hard and got out on the road. Like when I look at the list, I would say probably No Warning is the one that pops as the band that didn't really tour. Like they didn't really build their name off of touring like crazy. That record though. And with sh- yeah. <laughs> and what and what show and what shows they did. And at the time that the the front man Ben did like they were just an impactful thing. And I think Look again, the thing about victory and the money they had in hardcore, and this kid puts out this seven inch <laughs> and they're like, all right, fuck victory. You know, every kid wants this, this no warning record. It's fantastic to see that. Yeah, that's on Steve Martyr's label, right? And yeah. we should just one quick note. Uh, yeah. you said that Mad Ball, the comeback seven inches on Thorpe, the C D version's on Thorpe and and Steve puts out that seven inch. Oh, he did the vinyl for that. I didn't even know there was a record for that. That's sick. Right. Yeah, dude. Because you know your boy Zach's got the test press. Shout oh, out to Steve Martyr. What's up? Steve uh, uh, rules. All right. Now we go to Ben Edge for uh, some statistics. What's up, Ben? What's going on? Um, so it's funny. I, I broke out all the regions and the years and all like I do with all of these uh, best of decade lists we do. But uh, Zach did something pretty funny he he actually created like a professional looking pie graph of um the uh, regions and, and there's this giant blue thing that's that's the usa and it like dominates the entire you know p- pie which is funny but uh we want to get even more granular than just usa versus other regions we want to we we always do east coast west coast and then we do the middle of the country, Midwest slash Texas. And and then we look to other places like continental Europe, Canada, UK, Japan, et cetera, for these things. So uh, without looking, I know that the UK dominated the 70s list. East Coast dominated the 80s list, but not by a ton. And I think, and I know East Coast dominated the, the '90s list by even more. And I think this is the most East Coast dominated list so far. But go figure. You you got two East Coasters to, uh, you know, contribute their lists. So we you you kind of got what you expected. So we have 54 picks from the East Coast, 28 from the West Coast, nine from the Midwest slash Texas. One American pick that just can't be categorized by region, which is Limp Wrist, because we found out, and I've played many shows with Limp Wrist, but never 
really thought about like, where is this band from? Because I think Martin, he's from Chicago, then he moved to California, but I never thought about the other members. It's like a lot of guys from like Buffalo or upstate New York, and then Martin's not from there. And it's it's so random. We just put we put them under miscellaneous United States. And then uh, so that means 92 total from the United States, two from Canada, three from the UK. UK keeps keeps shrinking. Um, and and three from continental continental Europe, zero from Japan, zero from Australia is is what we have on this one hundred list. Any thoughts on that, Zach? Uh, I think it's a bad idea. I don't know about Australia in the two thousands, but as far as Japan, I have a bunch on my personal list. Everyone can check uh, one hundred eighty five miles south dot com. The master list is there as well as our individual list. I got a bunch of stuff. I uh, I don't know that Crow Records on there. Um, I'll, I'll mispronounce the band, but Muga M U G A they're on there. I got a, I got a fair amount of stuff, maybe five Japanese things. Um, Mm -hmm. so yeah, but disappointing. And, you know, I didn't want everything to be West coast centric. So that's why we got Richie and Joe to help out. And so I think, uh, America is pretty well represented, but really I would love to see some lists. If, if people live in the UK, continental Europe, Japan, Australia, get at us, hit us with your list. I'd love to see uh, what your perspective is because, you know, we can only speak for ourselves, but it is not the universal truth, you know? So I don't know. What's your, what's your idea, Ben? Um, I mean, it's kind of like, it, here's a good question. If you took the two East Coast guys out of it, what would the number, what would the breakdown look like? I mean, it's just too much work to do at this point, but I, I still think the East coast would, would be the, would be the dominating region. Don't, don't you think Zach? Yeah. I mean, it, it just has been for, for hardcore mostly, right. Since, uh, the nineties, you know, really the eighties, I guess too, or yeah. the, the later, the second half of the eighties and then to current times. Right. You know, or maybe current times is like the first time that it's like switched and, you know, there's a lot of West Coast stuff that's on top right now. Yeah, and I, I don't know what a, t- a tens list would would look like, but I just have a feeling that we're only like on our we're we're into our third year of the twenties. Sounds so weird to call it the twenties because I'm thinking of the 1920s, but like I think the UK is gonna gonna have a much larger representation. <laughs> you know, when it's you know, 2030 and you can do your, your top 100 2020 to 2029 list, man, that sounds strange. Um, very futuristic. Um, but we can do, we always do, um, a breakdown of the 100 list by year as well. So we can go to that if you want to now, Zach. Yep. Um, so, um, this is always interesting to find patterns. I think when we did this for when we did this for the seventies, obviously the last three years of the seventies were most of the picks because that's that's when punk records started coming out in the first place. And then for the eighties, it was like there was a big bump in the early eighties, a dip in the mid eighties, and then a bump again at the end of the decade, which we expected as well because you have that first generation peaking in like eighty three, and that second generation peaking in like eighty eight, eighty nine, and then for the nineties. Oh man, uh, I think that we had a huge bump, which was like all, in 1990, which was sort of like the everything getting sloshed over from the 80s, like whatever chain of strength bands like that still putting out records in 1990. Then you had a little bit of a dip, and then it, and then I think it was it held it holds kind of steady the rest of the decade with with the lowest number being the last year of the decade. So here we go for this decade, 2000, we have 16 picks. 2001, 17 picks, 2002, 10, 2003, 13, 2004, 8, 2005, 10, 2006, 9, 2007, 6 picks, 2008, also 6 picks, and 2009, 5 picks. So you have the first half of the decade is far more represented than the second half of the decade. So if you break break it into five year chunks, two thousand to two thousand four, 
you have 64 picks in that first half of the decade. 2005 to 2009, you have 36 picks in that decade. So first half of the decade, there seems to be a huge bias in favor towards. And then with the the largest number being 2001 and the smallest number of the whole decade being 2009 with with only five picks. So um, is this kind of what you expected, Zach? I guess so. Yeah, I mean, just from from our age, right? Like the our formative years are like the, the late 90s, the early 2000s. So that's like when a lot of stuff connected with us so much. I mean, myself, Dan, and and Chris, and Joe's the same age as me. So you would think that like maybe for him as well. So yeah, I, I figured it would it would aim a little earlier uh, for the for the more popular picks, but I don't know. It, it really yeah. So those first four years, two thousand to two thousand three, it looks like is is the bulk, and then it kind of the next few years it evens out like an average around like nine. And then it falls off to like an average of of six or five. But really, if you think about it, it's like, I don't know, how many albums have to come out in a year for it to be considered a great year for hardcore? You know what I mean? It's like if you get five great albums, like that's a pretty good year, right? Well, it's quality versus quantity. You could have a year that has like, you know, only 10 good records. But if five of them are like stone cold classics, then that's a good year, right? So. It's like, it really matters. It's just those individual albums that probably matter more. But when you do a thing like this, you know, a hundred's a pretty big number. Like you're going to include stuff that's, I guess, pretty good when you're getting into the, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s, not, not, not just um, stuff that's like classic front to back albums. So I think this gives you a good idea of what years you think really hold up compared to others. I mean, 2001, I mean, we did a super seven for 2000 and for 2001. And I remember th- be, kind of being surprised that 2001 was better than I remember it, but I don't think you did a couple super sevens within this decade without me, right? You must've done a 2006 Man. I think we did 2006, and that's the yeah. only other one we did for this decade. Right. So, um, how old is Richie? I don't know, Ben. Okay. Because <laughs> I'm trying to think, like, you're, we're all kind of in that same age group. I just thought, well, I don't know how old Richie is. So, maybe. He whatever. might be seven or eight years older. Okay. He's I, definitely I don't really older, know. though. Right. Definitely so, that older. makes sense that the bias would be in favor of the earlier in the decade. And then when you get closer to like where we are now, it seems like it will become harder to judge the later years of a given decade, especially if you did another one for the tens. I don't know if you're going to, but like, wouldn't that, I don't think we will. It's just too soon. Right. Like what are, what are the rules of the baseball hall of fame? Right. It's like, it's, it has to be a certain amount of years removed. You know, the only hall of fame, yeah, the the only Hall of Fame I'm really familiar with is Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and it has to be 25 years removed. For your your first record, your first re- commercially released recording had to have come out 25 yeah, years ago. Yeah, but who ago. gives a fuck about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Ben? Well, it's who gives a fuck about the Baseball Hall of Fame, <laughs> right? It's pretty good. It's a pretty good Hall of Fame. The Baseball Hall of Fame is a pretty good Hall of Fame. What's cool about the Baseball Hall of Fame and I only know this tangentially from other people talking about it is that there will be years where no one is inducted, which is so cool because it's just like, you know, the people who we're not doing this just to put on a show, like an HBO three hour program to get ratings, like kind of a rock and roll hall of fame thing. We're just doing this shit because this is what really matters. So that that's kind of cool. Like integrity wise. Yes. Way better. Okay, Ben, thanks so much for your help. Yeah. Okay, let's jump into this other stat, and then we're almost done with stats, and we can go back to just shooting the shit. I want to talk about the albums that made the list with zero consensus, and I think that this really speaks to, um, I guess, the consensus of this list. Not to overplay that word, but basically record number one through number 89 all had at least two people vote for it, which I think is is very important. When it comes to this, that's why I wanted to 
to do it this way. But uh, of the albums that made the list that only one person voted for, number 90, we talked that. Uh, Richie put it number four. Lars Fredrickson and the Bastards, the album Viking, came in number 90. Um, my number four was the Lawrence Arms LP, O Calcutta. So it came in at 91. Chris ranked Pressure Point, Resist and Riot, number nine. So it came in at number 95. Uh, Joe put Reach the Sky, Friends, Lies, in the End of the World at number 10. It came in at number 97. And he also put A Night, A Place Called Home at number 11. That came in at 99. So Dan is truly a man of the people. Um, he doesn't have any of his by themselves that make the list. His highest uh, ranked record that did not make the list was Hard Skin, Same Meat, Different Gravy. Uh, it was ranked his number 21, did not make the list. Um, the highest ranked record that made the list, and we all chose a different record. That's kind of interesting. Uh, Death Be Vortis Honor makes the list at number 28 with the LP Friends, Family, Forever. Uh, it got that record specifically made the list because Joe put it number nine. Richie had ranked Count Me In at number 14, and I ranked Better Ways to Die at number 62. So it gets on there at number 28. And that's all I got for stats. We'll uh, we'll kick it to Ben at the end of the, the show to break down the international and uh, the regional stuff. But yeah, very interesting. Um, overall, I'm pretty happy with anything. Dan, how do you feel? About the list in general or? Yeah, or anything yeah. you want to uh, pluck out and talk on. Yeah. Um, I'm surprised Cold World only came in at number 27. I feel they've got a very uh a very good like consistent every record is good and they've got a nice shadow over the decade in its entirety almost. Um I chose the Ice Grill 7 inch cuz I when that came out it just I was like this is exactly what I've wanted. This is what I've wanted for, you know, 10 years of hardcore like like I've wanted something that connects these two worlds I love and doesn't do it in a fucking cringe way, you know? Um, so, well, you should have gotten into E-Town. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Well, like let, that's, let, that's let, the problem with a lot of this stuff, right? It's like we're, people are waiting for the safe version, you know, of something. Not, it's not the safe version, but you know, we can go into particulars why, you know, I feel something like hits me in the right spot where something doesn't. And, you know, I don't want to, you know, I, I'm not going to go there, but, <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't regard it as a safe version. I just regard it as like really drilling into the, the other side of my record collection, you know, that's fair. But like, it, it could be seen as like the safer version of like an E-town where, like no warning is like a safer version of Madball. Is that incorrect? Well, yeah, I mean a lot of people couldn't agree more. Like the no warning record is is almost like benefits from following Madball, right? You know, it's like, okay, this is this is absolute perfect. Now let's let's even hone this for just a tiny bit more catch like catchier. I don't know. It's it's hard to it it's hero worship, but it comes off really well. Do you know what I mean? It's like it's all the tentpole records all culminating into one like just riff extravaganza because the riffs on Ill Blood fucking hell. Like Kool Aid Man through the wall right now. Like I just yeah, it's great. I mean, I mean, I, on the seven inch, on the seven inch too. Yeah, right. The first, the first song on the seven inch has like it's a perfect hardcore song. Oh my god, maybe no. maybe a little long, maybe a little long, but no, riffage need, and singing is perfect. I need more. Um, yeah, no, no <laughs> warning was my number two. Tragedy was my number three, and Madball was my number four. So like, like no warning and Madball are right there, like neck and neck, essentially. You know, just the most perfect vibe based hardcore records there are out there like just the bounce that both of those records are delivering it's like 
I would not be mad if other people were ripping that off till the end of time because it's just going to be giving me the bounce and the groove that I want. Let's talk. We don't have too much uh, stuff outside of the U.S., but Knuckle Dust, Time Won't Heal This, comes in at number 40. Um, Dan, talk on that record. Well, it it's this is a UK band that is essentially the band that has been going since the late 90s till now, never wavering from being just pure hardcore and holding down a scene when it, it got really thin for a long, long time. And, um, I mean, I think Richie and, and Joe can even talk to Knuckle Dust even stronger than I um, because of the the brotherhood that their bands have shared with Knuckle Dust. You want to speak on that, Richie? Yeah, Knuckle Dust is key, very important. And uh, the way they communicated with us over here in the East Coast, you know, uh, we did a tour when, when I was in Crutch in maybe 96, and we played with them in Belgium. And I, I remember thinking, like, how do these guys even know each other? Like they don't even look like they would ever cross paths in real life. They were <laughs> the most randomly selected humans to be in a band. Yeah. They, they, but it was so cool and it was brutal. And it was like, you know, it was like, you know, I, I was just totally impressed. And then from that day in the mail, so sending stuff back and forth. And then, uh, then they have like a, a label, a little local London label connected to them. And then, you know, and then we have a little label over here and it's, it's just, uh, it became a thing, but their releases were just getting better and better and better. And it's the same guys, the same four guys, like what, what band has, you know, 20 years plus with the same lineup. Absolutely. Just, uh, yeah. It's a special band, special bunch of guys. And yeah, even when London was on a low, those guys didn't give a fuck. I mean, if there's two people there, they're, they're acting the same. They're having a good time. They never complain. It's that band is the real deal, and I just I think every release is better than the next. Like I really, really like that band. I just have something special about that. Time won't heal this. Like it's yeah, because when it came out, it was so raw. And as as listeners to the to the pod will know, I'll always give a little extra ride in for something from the UK, just because you know I look back and and love where I came from. So you know, you just rep that a little bit harder. So when that came out, like I had that CD because at the time CDs were a bit more dominant and I just uh, played that like on tours all over and uh, and it was <laughs> and it was like what Zach said when, you know, the posse kids were embracing the hard stuff like around Hold It Down and stuff too. So like... <laughs> It is. Uh, it was a thing. Death threat, knuckle dust, hold it down were three of my choices that I used to terrorize the band <laughs> over my body with when it was my turn to drive. Let's dig into the list and, and choose something on here that maybe you hadn't heard before uh, that you discovered or also just something that you want to highlight off this list. Um, what I would say for me is I had never heard dead stop and it made the list i think let me uh let me find it here again sick band from belgium yep okay yeah and it was like really really good um yeah dead stop done with you lp comes in at number 58 i'd never heard it listen to it super awesome um the other one i just wanted to highlight was faded gray came in at number 30 and three of us voted for it so i'm assuming that's me dan and chris um yeah, Ben, I don't know if they ever made it to the East Coast, but God, that LP, A Quiet Time of Desperation. I really am not a fan of like what people would consider like melodic hardcore, but this like LP is just like the one that like gets me like right in the right spot, you know. Um, I've talked to death on the pod, like the metaphor that I use of like the marshmallow falling off the stick, you know? Like you're roasting a marshmallow, it's the best when it's just plump and before it's gonna fall off the stick. And obviously you don't want your shit to fall on the fire. Right. And like, this is there. Like if anyone takes it any further than this, I basically hate it. But for them, they just, 
it just touches on all these like emotional like things in me. It just, yeah, I don't know. It just tickles me in the right way. And I, I love this LP so much. Dan, you got anything on here that uh, you weren't aware of before that you dug or anything that you want to highlight? Um, so something that I've wasn't that familiar. I'm pretty, it's pretty much everything on the, the list that I at least have listened to. Well, actually, I don't really know Title Fight, and I've probably listened to that Lars Fredrickson and the Bastards, but I'm definitely going to go back and listen to it now with how strong the recommendation is to that. You've shown me the Lawrence Arms before, so that that's a thing, but um, there is a record on the list that I don't know at all, so that is the one that I'm going to choose next to listen to. And I will uh, at a later date, maybe for the Patreons, I'll I'll break it down what I thought of it. But that is stout sleep bitch. <laughs> so good. <laughs> I don't know that at all, but I'm gonna go uh, give that a listen at some point, and and I will uh, get back to you. Um, as far as like wanting to um, kind of just show something maybe to the listeners that's like kind of deeper in the combined list that I, I think maybe like just give a shout out to um, give a listen if they've never heard it. We've got uh, 77 and 79. We've got um, the No Tolerance Boston Straight Edge 7 inch. I think a lot of people are probably familiar with that. Uh, at 76, Justice, Look Alive 7 inch amazing european hardcore band and then uh the horror show seven inch coming out of joe's hood richie's hood um super super good i would say like give give those three seven inches you know because i love seven inches even if zach's trying to kill that genre off i mean that format (laughs) off um i would say buy all three of those seven inches on discogs and you're going to be really psyched yeah, and that justice, be careful. Just get the oh, seven yeah. inch. Because yeah. the LP is like that's that's one where you don't want to go in and listen to the wrong record. Yeah. Or that, book them on Edge Day, the record comes out. <laughs> <laughs> that that LP is one of those things where you know, like there's that funny like movie part that's like a meme now where it's just like, Oh, this is a betrayal. <laughs> that LP is a fucking betrayal. Yeah. Yeah. Chris, same question to you. Man, uh, <laughs> I have a funny E Town story. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell that. Uh, I I think I'm the only person that didn't pick E Town for this list. Um, not because I don't like that record, but just it's it's not one that I go back to uh, a ton. I think Dan but, didn't either. It's, it's only three of us. I was, yeah, I was they, tried to be bribed. That's right. <laughs> Dan, Dan's too proud to be bribed. Um, they were a band that only came out to Seattle once, um, or fall city to be exact, like, which is like 45 minutes out in the middle of nowhere, like in, in the woods, uh, east of Seattle. Uh, they played with the hoods and it was a cool show and they were awesome. And, you know, I got the record, I still listen to it, but it's, it's just not in my top hundred, but, uh, <laughs> when change was just, uh, back East, uh, a couple months ago, we flew into Newark at airport and everyone got in at like different times and I got in first. And so I had to kind of like just drive around and kill time, which, uh, if you're familiar with that area is, it's not too far from, uh, from E-Town. And, uh, I, w- I picked up Mike, our guitar player and, uh, we were just driving around and I'm like, and we had to kill like three or four hours and, and I'm like, let's just go. I like, I look at my Google, this is like a total West coast, like <laughs> mistake, you know, West coast dude going to the East coast. Right. Um, I look on my maps. I'm like, let's just go find a park to just go lay down in and like take a nap or something. Right. And, uh, after we drove through this park, I realized they were right. It was right across the street from like the Elizabeth town, uh, projects or whatever, but we're driving through this park and, uh, there's like a, a running track around this lake or, or something. And, uh, or like a marsh, and there's like little workout stations and there's this one workout station that has so many dudes working out, like probably like 20 people. Right. And they're like doing the craziest, like just 
street workouts, right? Like there's one guy doing pushups in the middle of the running track. Like people that are running on the track have to run around this dude <laughs> or like step over him. Right. And then I I'm so distracted by this dude doing pushups in the middle of the track that I missed it for a second, but I caught it right as we were about to drive by. There was a guy standing on top of the monkey bars doing squats and each squat, every time he would come up, you or come up, he would punch himself like, you know, in the abs. And it was just like, it was like such a crazy scene. And we were listening to E-Town at the time because, you know, when in Rome. Um, so that's my E-Town story. Um, <laughs> uh, to answer the question, hmm, I want to talk on pressure point for a minute. Um, I had them, I think, at number nine. Uh, I think you said, I can't find them on the list, but I think it's somewhere around 90. Um, I just think this is, in my opinion, the best American Oi, Oi record since Do or Die. Uh, this is a fantastic record. If you like um, Oi, this is this is a fantastic record. Jesus, sorry, I'm messing with my mute button. I, uh, <laughs> did you see the guy in the park that shot Logram? Sorry. Bad I did it. Well, I thought that was in like Houston or something. Bad die for the fame joke. You, you uh, can't say guy. You got to say the lyrics. <laughs> I'm not saying ah, the lyrics. Ah, <laughs> <not saying laughs> got him. <laughs> well, uh, backfire on me. Dude, E-Town, like, I have a special place for them too just because, I don't know, for whatever reason, like when I started playing in hardcore bands, like it was like a big thing that got put in us by I don't know who or what, but like was to play hard every night, whether people showed up or not. Right. And like I played in a band that toured and like, we played to like no people a lot of nights and we always played hard. So like whoever, like you, you can't, the diehards show up. Right. So if you draw 30 people, like those are the diehards, right? Like, why are you going to punish the 30 people that show up and give them a bad show because 300 people didn't show up. Right. The real is show up. So they deserve you to play hard for them. Right. And I've always tried to do that. Um, in E Town, like when they came out, the first time I saw them, they played Galita to I don't know twenty people, and they killed it, right? Like I I only had the first CD, and like they came out, no one was there, like they just weren't a popular band in the area, and that area is always it was hard to draw in anyway, unless like you're a Fat Records band. Um, and they came and played, and they played like really hard, and like were really good, and like I don't know that just crossing over with like that that punk mentality. And having a band like that, like, like exhibit it, it just made me really love them. And like the second time I saw them was at Chain Reaction, like on a real, real mixed bill. It was like Kill Your Idols, Carry On, and E Town. And like, I don't know, there was maybe 80 people there. And like, they were amazing. And that time they brought like the keyboard and shit. And I was like, fuck, these guys are getting down like this. Like, this is even better. You know what I mean? And then I think the third time I saw them was like what Joe was talking about on that Edema or whatever. They played with Il Nino. At like some like more f- like nicer club like in Hollywood, and it was like different by then. But like I don't know, like they just had like that. They were hardcore, right? Like w- we can look at it. I don't know. It's just they were real, and they came out, and I felt that, and like I connected to them like that. So some people like brush them off and and joke this and that, but I don't know. Like they were they were real when they came out. In my you opinion. know what about E Town? You have to keep in mind. When, you know, out this way, there was like a definitely a big separation and a band like E-Town was a joke to this snobby section of elitist. Mm. But then we fast forward to now and that there they still exist and they they could do a headlining show in New Jersey and get, you know, 1,500 people, 2,000 people there, and it's a big event, and everybody loves it, and everybody has their E-Town tattoos. And so it's almost like an underdog story for a person like me watching E-Town because I was in, in more in their camp than this other camp. And mm-hmm. just like E-Town, we didn't know why certain bands wouldn't fuck with us. It was kind of weird. You know, we just thought, oh, yeah, we're a hardcore band. You guys are a hardcore band too. Bet they check it out. You want... And then you start feeling like, oh, okay, it's like we're not the same for some reason, you know. So I look, I look at E Town as like an an underdog 
you know, that that did it. And it like, you know, just like they didn't blow up. They're not like Limp Bizkit, but they're like they did it as far as hardcore. Like now they are the respected hardcore band from the past when people back then would say, what is this shit? This is not hardcore. You know, who are these people? Who are these kids? You know, they, they kind of turned it around and really made a name for themselves within the scene. You know, it was just, you know, against all odds, really, because they didn't have the so-called popular people and popular bands backing them and asking them to do stuff. And, you know, what that at all. Yeah. Yeah. Richie, you want to pluck anything out of this list to speak on? You know what? I was surprised that I, I thought H2O, uh, that H2O album would be higher. Mm. I think that, that's a real good album. I thought it would really be up there. I thought it would be in the top 20 easy. I think it's in the 30s, yeah. wherever we have it, which is not bad. That's a great showing, but very surprised. I thought, with, especially with, uh, you know, I thought, you know, we have some West Coast guys. They might like that style a little more anyway, but what do I know? I don't know. Yeah, it comes in at number 44, H2O, nothing to prove. Um, and I think maybe just you and Joe went for it. It got the 10 bonus points, so two people voted for it. Um, oh really? I, you guys didn't even mess with it, wow, dude! I I like with a lot of stuff. Like I'm, I swear to God, I'm not trying to be a hipster, but I just like the first record, <laughs> you know. Like this was the bad. first palatable record since the first record. Yeah, to me, it yeah. was their best one. Like I this this is the one I could listen to. So we're on the same page, Zach. I should I really just... listen to it, and and dude, even that first record, like I love it, love it. But I had to go and I put that in my software. I edited out all the skits. So like that's how I can listen to it because like mm. I couldn't listen to that first record anymore because the skits are just so. I mean, I do skits; it's, it's a sample. It's like oh, I can't listen to this. Did you do the same thing with the your One Life Crew record or no? <laughs> <laughs> who, who Life Crew? Yo, hey, you, Jen, check, check Jen, this out. Record, got, let me ask you guys a question though, because when yeah, Joe yeah. was was totally dis- dissing uh, Have Heart on his rant, <laughs> he, he mentioned at their show there was a bunch of herbs. Do you guys use that word out in the West Coast or in the Not UK? Herbs is yeah. that? A, a, yeah, yeah, you do. Yeah. No, I mean, from hard. Yeah, no, from no one's hard- ever said that on the West Coast. That's from, like no. from hardcore. Yeah, okay. it's so people that are larping, right? I you thought know? it was a regional thing, so I just wanted to know if okay, that's what. I herbs. That's I pretty, say pretty it a lot word, right? because I hang out with Jeff Jock and he just says it all the time. So yes, he does. I say it. <laughs> Herbs. <laughs> it's a great it's a great term yeah it's a good term but sometimes when i'm with certain people they don't they, they didn't know what I'm, i was talking about so uh yeah i was wondering when he said that i was like oh that's a good like a regional thing wonder if these guys know that deal <laughs> herbs it's a you very good you've you got your own little slang out there you like to call everybody a fool what a fool <laughs> <laughs> i like that though i like that fool is a good one yeah timeless timeless joe you want to pluck anything on this off this list to speak on yeah, there's a couple cool things. I see that the unless I'm mistaken, the only split was the no reply lice hall, and that's a fucking sick split. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad that that made the list. I also was surprised to see an alkaline trio, Murder City Devils, hit the list. But and and even Dillinger for it. Now that I'm scrolling second time, but I those bands were absolutely impactful to hardcore in general. Even though they would grow, I, I worked a couple shows in the 2000s working shows for the Lawrence Arms. So I was pretty privy to them. The vowels I was completely unaware of. But I, I like the diversity. I like, I love seeing strength for a reason to get loved. I love seeing a lot of bands that would not make someone who was trying to look cool for Revolver uh, in here. You know, like this is earnest. All these bands earned their place and this is an earnest thing no one tried to cool guy anybody can you imagine if death threat had been number one on the revolver list i i would i would i would wonder who got bribed (laughs) (laughs) you know because it's 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 semantics and it's like oh you know we want to make sure this band and, and and to go back to that first point a band like set to explode never would have made the top 100 and and that's because it's the way it goes it's always about thing now obviously the certain records probably were placeholders for bands like in the case of the title fight thing like towards the end of the 2000s here nothing could touch title fight i mean and and to speak to what dan was saying about um cold world dedicated was the record for me and um 
Uh, he didn't want to touch on. There was a moment just like with Mad Ball to No Warning where kids who were old enough and men, full ass men, were old enough to watch Mad Ball, but chose the cap for No Warning. The kids, specifically two or dudes in um, Cold World, really were adjacent to a hardcore scene that was very much what Cold World would eventually culturally appropriate for the nerds. And it was only, and it was only, and it, and it was only through the love of the Keystone hardcore scene coming together that eventually all was absolved or forgotten. But there was a li- like a little line to saying like, "Oh, now you guys are going to get funny and start re- you know being into this kind of stuff." Yeah. Totally. In the beginning, in the beginning, it was like not mocking an E Town Concrete thing, but more or less like. Oh, you nerds want to have your own hard band? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, well, that but, whole I crowd mean, always did everything out of being ironic. You know what I mean? Exactly. Now, now you're. Now, this thank is you ironic. For saying that. Check. Listen to our new band. It's ironic. It sounds like this band. We're ironic. And no, some of those guys are my friends. I love the the lead singer, but a lot of them are, are dorks. We got to be honest. Just be, <laughs> they they were just obsessed with like mockery and like oh that's funny oh that guy's wearing a puffy jacket oh my god oh my god it's like you know they were kind of they were like people walking through a zoo almost you know and well, they were just what what's interesting uh, about that richie is like that's what's so cool about doing this project because you're in the trenches there you know like seeing that whereas we're consuming it on another coast just enjoying it for what it is to an extent yeah you know? yeah totally and to go back to what has been discussed, like in the E Town ephemera, co- like um, conversation, yeah, I fully admit, like coming out like late nineties, I didn't give some of the harder hard bands uh, because it was a fucking like it was like you were like almost inculcated to be like, oh, you know. There's always fights at these shows. They're ruining venue, you know, like DIY Mm -hmm. venues, whatever. But it was all bullshit. It was all just absolute rumor mill bullshit because there was no, well, (laughs) the internet provided a different kind of rumor rumor mill, but pre-internet, it was just straight up like telephone, you know, like you, I heard this and I heard that. And like, there was some times where, yeah, I was listening to like, age of quarrel but i wasn't given a band that sounded somewhat similar that was made up of real dudes like a fair shake at the time in like 1997 where i absolutely should have been and and you know i fully admit that um and that's why like around that's why what zach says about like death threat being released by b9 and um and mad coming uh, around that time and terror like just it opened i mean i was i wouldn't say like that was like i was already ahead of that curve uh, around that time but for many of the same people that were like i don't know for lack of a better term just thinking stupidly like these were massive gateways to opening like crushing all the walls down yeah and then as you say, the internet does provide other kinds of walls and other kinds of rumor mill bullshit, but it was like a a thing. So maybe there was just a an element of my blinkers being on in the late nineties to not giving E Town a fair shake. But also, there was the N word <laughs> that w- in there, which you know was the N word a thing back then? Like, not I, at honestly, all. Back then, it was like I didn't think twice of it. Like, I mean. Not Here, anyway, all. the N-word was, uh, I mean, every white boy that was semi no, I, lived in around an urban area, they just talk like that. And, and uh, I didn't think twice. I know later on now, yeah, like, yeah, come on, you should know. I didn't know about it to the Eagles parade. The young kids said that you're not allowed to say that word. I was like, which word? <laughs> I couldn't figure out what word it was. Then they said the deal. I was like, oh, shit, I didn't know it was over. Like, we know you're not allowed to say the N-word as yeah. in the er but we didn't know you're not allowed to say the a one which was like friend you know what i mean yeah yeah but uh it was yeah that was totally normal and uh at the time and uh i don't think they that they didn't think like yo saying this is gonna 
give us like street cred or so. I don't even, it was just like, unfortunately it was just in the terminology at the time. And if, if anybody acts like, Oh, if you said that you'd get your ask. No, quite opposite. Everybody said it in front of every well, race. I- Chinese kids were saying it. The Spanish <laughs> kids were saying it like it, but not in the, you know, the racist form. Like, no, they were just 100%. Saying it. Hip- right. And, yeah. and also, and also E-Town, E-Town adapted because by the, by the album that you guys chose the Renaissance, it's not on there. Yeah. Well, and and also, if we're talking two thousands, there were plenty bands out west saying the f word, uh, not fuck the other f word, on stage mm. like mosh u f's and stuff like that, and oh yeah, yeah, that was extremely distasteful to me at the same time. But you know, it was just a a thing of of the times that you know people have grown from you know but it yeah it was and if you you know what it would be embarrassing if your band if you're like you have footage of your band and you're up there and you're saying that i'd be like ah damn it man i can't believe that shit's out there but yeah at the time i mean that's what people said you're looking back like yeah that's pretty like what if there's a dude in the audience and it's like oh come on what the fuck is wrong with you you're insulting people you don't you don't think twice it's just a word but yeah People learn, you know. Yo, you're right. Band said that left, right, and center on the, like back then. It was crazy. So check this: we play, we go as a roadie. This four year common correct tour. We get it. We get to Gilman Street, and because Gilman's weird like that, the bill was R.I.P. Sammy the Mick. All bets off. Dysphoria, and then it was uh, kill the man of questions from Philly, page ninety nine. And it coming correct. Sick lineup. And Sammy the Mick got up first, and he dropped the ha- the F. Yeah. And no factor while he played. Sammy the Mick. And then uh, show gets to come and correct. Page ninety nine said something, but we didn't really catch all what was going down. The kill the man of questions people. We I knew them because I went to the punk shows in the area, but we weren't friendly, and they were older than me. And then. During Come and Correct, Rick was like, We all gotta get along and saying whatever crazy spiel he had. And um Andrew, who actually plays in Limp Rest, and this is why I put his thing on my my thing, he was like, Yo, well then if, if everyone feel should feel good, why are you why are you good with him saying that? He was confronting Rick on stage to turn a whole cr- cr- for level. So outside we're talking, and he's the one who put me onto it that's saying the F was the same way as saying the hard R. And no one in my entire life have ever said that. Mm. Yeah. So I'm standing here at like 19 years old in California. Somebody who lives in Philadelphia basically putting me on to like, you don't really understand what that means. And I really fucked my whole world up. I'm like, wow. Gotta that, watch that work. That's the absolute, that's the true essence and beauty of like punk and hardcore right there, really. Is the ability to confront something, but not with just single-minded like i'm just gonna talk over you because i'm right it's like let me show you why and this is my personal this is my personal experience with it and this is why this has fucking ruined my life and if that is allowed to happen in this free thinking space we've lost you know and i think that's i think that's awesome it was it was it was a learning moment another thing i should say um there was a time in this area, in Philadelphia specifically, which is why my list is a little skewed towards some of the faster hardcore stuff. Death Threat, Bulldoze, um, definitely 25 to Life, E-Town Concrete, Fury of Five, was known as Joe Hardcore Hardcore. <laughs> yeah. Because I was like the kid who, I mean, in and, and my book, my first show, 16 in 97 in, in March. I was the one trying to bring this kind of stuff because we were going and seeing it elsewhere, but they weren't really playing. And it was almost like a mockery. And then towards the end of the 90s, like E-Town now is playing the Trocadero. Then the people who were mocking this stuff is either for it or they're already out of hardcore. I find it very bizarre that at a time when like other stuff was very popular, that all of a sudden the things that we were kind of made fun of for like got bigger in this whole entire area. And, and I love that you guys put some love on the stout because they got a lot of, they had a lot of people at the, in the 2000s. Same thing for strength for a reason. There's a lot of bands that were smaller 
a lot of those records in the in the forties and fifties in the list were smaller, but their impact impacted people in hardcore. So his list is really cool in that regard. And uh I, I just really like that, you know, if someone's if someone is young and wanted to check out some records, man, you know, you can't go wrong at stop and think. You can't go wrong at some of these actually you said faded gray. I remember they're from Vegas. That's why that's why they never came to the East. But we played Vegas and Reno pretty regularly on our tours. So we played with them one time. But I until you put that on the list, I'm like, oh shit, I hadn't thought about that band in years. I think they might you know? have done a small tour with Count Me Out. Uh that was that it was a very small uh national tour that they did with Count Me Out. Um that's that's probably it also another thing is the explosion. Dude, there was a minute in Philly and Boston and Richmond where that band for hard, like in hardcore before they went and played bigger stuff. Every hardcore band from those city, every hardcore kid, everyone loved them. So I'm glad to see some of these snapshots and the things that were still around. Overall, I was just happy that you guys asked us to be a part of it. I know this is like you know, the 185 miles up. You guys are the the best hardcore podcast talking about real music, real records and real cool shit. So I was really happy to be a part of it and get to go back and forth with you guys. And also it's kind of crazy to think of the diversity of each individual's list. Are you guys going to be posting these lists for everyone to consume? Yeah, they're or just up. the main list? They're up. Everyone can check the list is on the website, 185 miles south.com and all our individual lists are up on the, the website too. Dude, that's so fucking cool. Yeah. I mean the beauty and hardcore in the two thousands and Daniel was a part of this. I mean, he played a basement in West Philadelphia with death threat and terrorist first tour. You know, like that's crazy. Like his band was a part of a basement show and you can't even book any of them bands at a basement. Now the mm-hmm. fucking house would get shut down by the police. Well, do you know what? But at the time there were still bands having to go down to the basement to build their bands up. I mean, I see mental in basements. I seen a lot. Of, I fucking hate a house show. Now you can't get me to see anybody unless it's wisdom and change. Cause Richie's my best friend. Aside from that, I'm not seeing none of your raggedy. No house. House. What are you crazy? That's what I'm saying. I ain't playing no fucking raggedy unless basement got shows. Good food. <laughs> yeah, maybe yeah, the mom's cooking something nice, nice sweet sauce, you know, maybe we'll come by. But th- a lot of cool shit came from the basements of hardcore and I and I almost wish that sometimes bands would go back not to do it anachronistically, but go back to the DIY part and and build the names up the right way because that's why those records from those bands who did that work then stick out 20 years later to me. That's my perspective on that list. You know what's funny, Joe, is... And I'm, you know what? You guys schooled me on uh, Carry On and Count Me Out. I got to I oh, gotta check this shit out now. You're going to love it. Dude, Rich. Carry On's sick. Those fucking records. Dude, I'm telling you, Rich. Like, Joe, I'm you know how you. I get. I kind of lose focus and I just... Well, you got to remember also, and, and this is for everyone listening, we were divided by cities and different groups like... Carry on never played a proper venue in in the Pennsylvania area, except for maybe like maybe if that I don't even think that Lemoyne venue was out. They were playing like the Stalag thirteen and like they were playing different stuff. You know, um, so like we and the internet didn't make everybody you weren't able just to click on a screen and scroll down and see this. So they either hit the carry on or you weren't because Philly had it. And that's what the kind of shows I was always like, well, I'm gonna go see some hardcore. And I was glad I was because carry on literally them and internal affairs and you know that whole california thing that was coming out even i noticed a throwdown even though it was haymaker throwdown made it out like the california scene came up hard in the 2000s out here dan what are you trying to say it's funny you bring up that um basement show with death threat and terror because that tour was you know vogel and i would be down front for death threat every night singing dead at birth and then Terra played london last night and i'm over here for a holiday visiting friends and we went down for the high viz terror show and um i'm up front singing along they they go into um dead at birth and i i just start losing my shit and <laughs> singing along and vogel like pulls me up on stage and makes me like sing like some of it and it was just that full 20 years like rounding the corner of like this was what we were doing 20 years ago together singing along to our favorite band you're covering them you see me in the crowd we're in a different country 
and he pulls me up on stage and it's just yeah it was just speaking to what you were just talking about for that basement show it's just so poignant that this happened last night is that like when nick cave pulled you up on stage pretty much (laughs) i don't know who's the bigger legend vogel or nick cave it's very close i think we played that basement with my luck and final plan what a bunch of freaks all right dan (laughs) final thoughts on the pod um i i mean i i can't state how much i love talking hardcore reminiscing and chopping it up to where we see what has the staying power and the lasting power and what you know this awesome semi-scientific process does to allow us to drill down to what really are the records that matter now i encourage all the people who are going to listen to this pod especially those ones who will be screaming at us Jane Doe is low ranked because it it arguably is. It just doesn't matter to these five people as much as it does to the people who are screaming at their phones right now. But I do encourage every listener who has, you know, got through the pod to this point, like hit though when we post about this on the 185 Instagram, hit with all the things that you think we missed, hit with things that you think maybe wouldn't have made the list but it's definitely worth checking out like a a deep cut from the arts like let's keep this discussion going because this is just the the rich that's the thing about you can be a music fan of a million different genres out there and you can have a few cool discussions but the thing about being a hardcore kid and like a part of this thing of ours type stuff is that we cut through the bullshit and we know what really matters and we know who was real and, and what they meant and the things that have the staying power. It's unlike any other genre in the world. And that's why talking it is so important. So that's the thing I'd like to leave uh, talking about this list and encouraging further discussion with people because that's the richness of doing a project like this. Yeah, and also you can send in your list, right? 185 miles south at gmail.com. If you uh, go on these these lists, you know, they're there by the decade. And then when you click through, you can see the individual lists of all the people that voted to uh, to make up the master list. But then at the bottom of that, there's a link to all the listener lists. So anyone that uh, wants to put their money where their mouth is, send in a list. You know, it's easy to complain. But man, when you go through this process and almost everyone to a person – that's emailed me lists or hit me up and sent in stuff. They're like, you know, I had no idea how hard this was going to be until I did it. And so respect for all the people that did and they're on the website, the listener lists are up. So shout out to all those people that uh, have participated from the seventies and beyond. And, and if you got lists for 2000, send them in, I'll post them on the website. This is a group effort. This whole podcast is a group effort. Um, You know, so Joe, I, I take that, that uh, you appreciate being a part of this, but we needed you guys, right? Like, Hardcore is so easy, you know, back in this era that we're talking about, like they're just blind spots, right? Like I needed you guys. So strength for a reason, like gets on the list, right? They're a band that doesn't come out here. I listen to them. I like it, but I don't really know where to start. I don't know how to attack the catalog, but like they do need to be on here, right? It's top 100 of the two thousands. It should be on here. And so we need your guys help on that. And, and you guys did a great job. So I appreciate you guys. Uh, Chris, final thoughts on the pod? Uh, yeah, two things. I think first, like, <laughs> I've listened to you guys do the previous decades before this, and every time I, I just, I appreciated hearing uh, your perspectives, and and every time I thought, man, I'm glad I'm not doing this with them because <laughs> <laughs> this is just going to be murder, like you know, like, and and it was, it was really hard to kind of like, uh, put together a list that felt like true to myself and and also kind of weigh some some perspectives that i think probably um are are wider than my own opinions and and factor that in a little bit and uh i mean the amount of like tinkering i did with my list like moving things up like two spots or down three spots like Mm -hmm. the amount of torture that went into like the 101 you know and 102 and like those that just missed the list because it's a lot of really good stuff like i'm looking right now at my list and it's just like overflowing with like you know 30 more bands that i i didn't get to get on my list that i think are really cool so 
Um, it's all fun. Like, I don't think I know anything more than anyone else out there, but I love hardcore and I love talking about hardcore that I love. So thanks for letting me do this. And then the other, the second thing I wanted to, uh, to bring up, I didn't catch, uh, we're, I think we're missing the ghost of someone on this, uh, is it the ghost <laughs> of Ian Curtis. Did you veto any, any picks? The ghost of Tim Yohannan. <laughs> That's um, <what> it was. <laughs> no, I, I didn't veto any picks because Dan didn't line step this time around. And we didn't have Bedge. So uh, there was no line stepping. All this stuff is straight up hardcore. Lots of stuff uh, that didn't make the list is still straight up hardcore. No one fucked around and tried to like sneak through some bullshit, you know, which happened in all the previous decades. The Um, ghost of Ian Curtis would have put AN at number one. (laughs) The ghost of Ian Curtis might have allowed you to put Joy Division, Unknown (laughs) Pleasures, as number one punk record of the 70s. But you know, I ain't letting that fly, and neither is Tim Yohannan. So what's up? All right. Uh, Richie, final thoughts on uh, this podcast and then the list as well. You know what? What we did for the hardcore kids out there is something special. I hope they appreciate this. We did a lot of hard work, right, boys? We put it together. We thought about this. We dug deep. And uh, in the end, we gave them a combined list that is second to none. It should go down in, in in the history books. The definition of of the 2000s can be called upon at any time by future hardcore archaeologists to study, and our list will be their main artifact. This is I very second important. that. Yes, good times. Yeah. I appreciate. It. I had a, I had a fun time doing it. I thought it was going to be hard, and it was hard. But we all took it serious. Nobody fucked around. Joe took a little longer than we wanted. We, you know, we had to wait for him. But he was really, uh, he really put his mind to it, and we got it done. Yeah, shout out to Richie, the only one that voted to get noodles on the list. I love it. That's it. But, you know, um, yeah, I, I appreciate that, Richie, because I think it's important to put this stuff out there. It's hard, and it's hard to put your name on something, but it's important to talk about this stuff. And, you know, we got inspired by Pusshead doing his list of the 80s. And as critical as you want to be, right, you can look at anything and tear it apart. But at the end of the day, it's just like, it's a starting point. It's a conversation piece. And it's like, if you were to make someone a playlist of like the top 50 or this top 100, like it is pretty representative of the 2000s. So while it may not be the be all end all for everyone, it is a great starting point. And I think we, uh, we touched on, on a lot of stuff. So I think it is representative in, in a pretty good list. Joe, what's your uh, final thoughts here? Again, just to be included in a conversation about hardcore is always fun. But when it's with people amongst my peers, my friends, people that I've known for so long and whose opinions I respect, it's it's just nice to be a part of this. I I truly have a time when I read this shit on the internet, when these lists come out, and I just grind my teeth. And then the social media way of, constantly tweeting and all that gets on my nerves so to have a good conversation and not have any like grinding points where we can't agree would aggravate me whereas with this we all kind of went back and forth and i think it's important there's a lot of younger kids who do not want to feel uncool so they'll say things like well nah i'm not really my thing instead of saying yo you know what i never heard of this so maybe this list gets a second look at some of these records that deserve another shot you know or got buried because people were only talking about American Nightmare being Have Heart and Madball. You know, like maybe some some of these things that got filtered through into this list will get some kids excited about stuff they never heard of. And that's also another key reason why I thought it was great because even though there was a lot of diversity in the thoughts, we all kind of came together on key records and I just appreciate being a part of it. Hell yeah. Everyone check out the the list, one hundred eighty five miles south dot com. It's up there, the main list, which is a combined list, as well as all our individual lists are on the website. And also, there is a playlist for every episode, 185milesouth.com. Click that playlist link at the top of the page, and you can listen to the music uh, we talked about. So this is a pretty good 2000s playlist. I've listened to it a bunch since I made it, and uh, you guys can all vibe. Check that out. Uh, Dan, where can people find you? On Instagram, at Southport Instagrammer. Chris, where can people find you? Uh, Chris Williams 51 on Twitter and Instagram and also NWHC radio on both Twitter and Instagram. 
Oh yeah, Richie, where can people find you if you want them to? Uh, I don't have any personal Instagram, but the band Wisdom and Chains on uh, on Instagram and and a new label Never Ran Never Will on Instagram. Follow that for some good upcoming future releases. Oh yeah, Joe, where can people find you? At the Joe Hardcore Instagram and Twitter. Oh yeah, everyone get at me. 185 miles south at gmail.com. That's the best way I respond to everyone. You can also get at 185 miles south on Instagram or Twitter. That one gets a little weirder. I don't know how it works, so I might not get back to you. The Gmail is the best way. Also, my personal is Zach Retaliate on Instagram. And you know, Retaliate is the best LP of the 2000s. 2006 Retaliate coup d'etat. What's up? Everyone, listen to that shit. Learn it. Love it. I love you all. We'll talk to you all soon.